as you might have determined by that, uh, we are in a place with a live audience. And right before we begin and I introduce my guest, I want to tell you what this is truly about. This is a show that I've wanted to do for a long time. Um, I had to figure out what was the best way and, and, and how to present it. And here's the premise, is that I work with great people. I work with people with tremendous backgrounds and stories to tell. And these people who present with me that I have been so privileged to know and to be with, you never hear about any of this on stage. Because there's a premise that I want to give you as a speaker and an author. And that is when we are speaking and when we're presenting on stage, we don't, we don't want to talk about ourselves. That's not why the people came. That's not what they paid for. And this, I wanted to be an opportunity not to teach. We're not going to teach anything today. It's about backgrounds, what has happened, what has happened to us, profound things, funny things, what were the things that, that made the differences. These are things you won't necessarily ever get from any of the authors that you will see on stage. You will only get the teaching. And so this is an attempt to make that happen. And in order to do this correctly, I wanted to do one that was completely free, and that's this one. And we're going to set it up so that it'll be on, on streaming services for at least 60 days. And then after that, I may put it on YouTube. So this particular presentation with my guest today may just last forever. You know, because anything, there's a there thing that says that once it's on YouTube, it's there forever. Yeah. So, but this is, my, this is my hope. Because what we're doing today is with somebody who is a very good friend that I've known for maybe 20 five years, and I happen to know a lot about his background and things that he's never said uh, on stage before. So this is a chance for you to meet and understand my good friend, Greg Braden. Hey. Uh, hey thank you. Thank you for hey, doing this, Liz. I, I, uh, first, I just want to say welcome to everyone, our studio audience, everybody watching uh, live, streaming tonight. And Lee, I want to thank you. First, thank you for allowing me to be your first. I'm very oh, honored. Yeah. And, uh, and, you know, I was thinking about this uh, as I was getting ready tonight. Often these kinds of programs happen after someone has left this world. <laughs> so I'm, I'm really grateful that you yeah. didn't wait until I was gone to do this. And I get to, I get right. to talk about this a little well, bit. Well, I got tired of waiting, Greg, yeah. actually. Well, it's, and, you know, I'm on a 200-year uh, plan. So. I know. The, <laughs> um, I don't feel I really have to introduce you because this is going to be this is going to be happening as we discuss your life, and people are going to know who you are. But for those very very few, we have um, the last count. I understand something like 3,200 people wow. are tuned in right now and listening to us live. Most of those people who would know who you were. If they don't, uh, let me just say, um, you are a Hay House author. You've been doing this for almost 30 years. You're established. You are a best-selling author. A lot of people will put that after their name yeah. as just uh, something that, that you know they say. But you are, and so you've been a random house author before Hay House. And, and random House. before before Hay yeah. House. Yeah. All right. Um, what most people know about you is you present things that are very thought-provoking. They're out of the box. You are a scientist, mm -hmm. and you do research and. Uh, and what, what I like about this is you're elegant, you have finesse, you have charisma, you, you speak truth, and you do it very well. And this is the part of the popularity is your honesty, and the things that you present, you are passionate about. And so that's how we know you. Now, we're not teaching today, no. but we're going to go, people will, are going to meet you, you know, through this. And uh, first question I want to ask you is, in the scheme of the pictures we show, why don't we have more pictures? Well, first, um, first I, I just want to back up about half a step. And what you said before in this introduction is so true. I think one of the most difficult things for an author to do is talk about themselves. Mm -hmm. uh, they're very accustomed to talking about their work, their research, their passion. Uh, but the, the events in our lives that have led to our ability to do those things, we really don't get to talk about very much. So it's not the easiest thing to talk about sometimes, but, uh, but you're right. So thank you for that. You, yeah. We will not see as many pictures as I would like to share tonight because I am uh, the archivist uh, and the librarian in our family. All of the memories, the family members have come to me. 2014, our home in northern New Mexico was one of the coldest winters on record. The temperatures were like 46 degrees below zero, three consecutive nights. We had a pipe that froze. I was out of the country when it melted. Uh, the uh, pipe broke, the house flooded. And I'll just, I'll tell you, that we're telling stories. Here's how it happened. Yeah. I have a man that watches my house for me, a neighbor. 
And he called me, and I was in Western Europe. And he said, my brother, I have bad news. He said, there's water coming out from underneath your front door. And I said, well, <laughs> I said, have you opened the door? He says, I'm afraid to open the door. He says, it's all frozen on the driveway. And I said, well, open the door. So he opened the door, and the water just rushed out. And the well had continued to pump the water for about 10 days while we were gone in an adobe structure. Adobe is a mud brick structure, and it was eroding away the adobes that had been built in 1888. The reason I'm, I'm sharing this is because uh, the, the archive of family images was destroyed by either the water or the black mold that, uh, that followed that, and we have just a very few images left. So, so that's why the long answer to a short question, that's why we don't have so many images here. And that's important for the people to know. So the ones we do have, I'm going to show on the screen, and the audience is going to he uh, uh, see them. And what I want to do is um, you're going to see these images. Is what I want to do is, is you're going to talk about them as, okay. as we show them. So right. I want to get right to what I'm going to call the early years. And we're going to go right to some images. So Carl, would you put the first one on? This image. Uh, so literally, in that flood, my entire life history is, is gone. So what you're going to see here is all the, all the memories I have are right here. This is an image. Uh, this is my mom holding me. This is the earliest image I have of me uh, in the early 1950s. Um, my father had been in the Korean War. He was stationed in um, a radar outpost, a very cold Alaskan nights, outside of Anchorage. And it was because of those cold nights, and they had a very small bed, my mom told me. And now there's a Greg. <laughs> uh, I don't understand that. Would you explain that? No, I cannot All do right, that. Fine, and, sorry, and, and do it well. Go so this is, this is the earliest image I have. My mom, uh, my mom holding me. I think she was 22 years old in this picture. And how old are you there? I'm less than a year. I don't know the exact age, okay. but it was within the first year of my is life. Is that an original Woody station that wagon? That is a Woody beam? station wagon that my parents, they drove from Anchorage, Alaska to Kansas City, Missouri. Uh, and I was, I was conceived in Anchorage, almost born in Anchorage, and at the last moment, uh, they thought they had better medical care in Kansas City, Missouri, so I was where my mom's parents were. So um, I, I was born in Kansas City, Missouri, and that's where this image was. Kansas standing. City, okay, uh, Carl next, if you will. Who is this? This is probably the youngest picture that I have of my mom. This is also at 22 years old. She had just won a beauty contest. Isn't she beautiful? This is my beautiful mom. Uh, yeah, and that's, uh, I love this memory uh, of my mom. It's the, uh, it's her at the youngest age that, that I have. And as we go through this, you'll see her through the years and you'll be able to compare this. Okay, let's look at the next one. All right. <laughs> <laughs> who is who? Okay, I have, uh, we have a small family. I have a younger brother. His name is Eric. He's four years younger than I am. This picture was taken, um, <clears throat> This picture was taken the year my parents divorced, and it was a, uh, a portrait that was taken. And it means a lot to me. My brother looks really happy in this picture, and that's the way I, I like to remember him. He's, he's still living in Kansas City. Uh, I don't see him smiling like that so much anymore. Mm -hmm. So this was a, a pivotal year for our family. It mm -hmm. was a pivotal year for us is uh, going into a single parent family. and. Um, yeah, this is, it's a good memory. I'm happy that, that I've got that picture. You know, a lot of siblings, when uh, one wears glasses, the other one does too. Do you need eye, a correction at all? You know, interesting thing is happening with my eyes. I wore glasses when I was younger. Mm -hmm. uh, and as I've gotten older, the, both eyes went to exactly the same prescription. Wow. And the prescription, the need for lens has gotten weaker and weaker and weaker for both of them. So I do, sometimes I'm nearsighted. I am nearsighted, so sometimes I wear glasses, but it's the same, or contacts. Mm -hmm. But they're exactly the same prescription in both eyes. So. I love it. Yeah. Let's, do, let's do another one. All right. Okay. <laughs> okay, this is the first one we're going to see with you holding a musical instrument. We're going to talk about music later, but yeah. tell us what's happening here. Well, music's been a very important part of my life. I, I'll just, uh, can I tell a story? Of course. Okay. At a very early age, this was um, also, uh, my parents actually separated twice before they actually divorced, and this is over one of those separations. And as a young boy growing up in northern Missouri, uh, my refuge was music and nature, and I know many people in our audience can certainly relate to that. Um, and this was the very first guitar that, uh, that I'd ever had. Um, I think your mic isn't happy. Are you sitting in the pack, or is it? 
Can you hear me? I, I hear it. Um, I'm getting a little bit of a buzz sometimes, not all the time. Welcome to live TV, everybody. <laughs> okay, I'm on. Okay, yeah, no, it's the good. The buzz is free. Good. We won't okay, charge you for the buzz tonight. I think it reacts to you sitting on it. It's, it's, your, it's your butt. <laughs> yeah. We could talk about my butt. I never had much of a butt. I've been waiting. I've been waiting for a donor from the butt bank for years, uh -huh. and we cannot That's find right. a donor. Right. So, you know, Greg, I want to. I want to thank you for this butt talk. So, so uh, I just want. Is is this better if I put the mic up here? Yeah, it's actually great. Good. Okay, I'm. Uh, I've got. A, you got me on the short leash, but I'm going to put the mic right there. <laughs> And because of this daytime black that I'm wearing, it will blend beautifully with this cable and you won't even see the seamless technology going on here. So the guitar uh, was very, very important for me. I'll, I'll tell you what happened in 1965, 64, 65, uh, Paul McCartney came out with uh, the single, it was Yesterday, I know many people remember music yesterday. And during the time my parents were deciding if they were going to stay married or not. One of the times my father came back, one of the conditions was that he do something with the kids because he was never around, very inaccessible. And uh, he said, well, Greg, what do you want to do? And I said, I want to take guitar lessons. So my father and I, for about six weeks, this is how long it lasted, <laughs> six weeks we took guitar lessons with uh, an amazing pianist who was teaching us guitar, and her name was Ms. Kinapaski. I remember this, Ms. Kinapaski, who would bang out the music on her piano while I was playing my guitar. You couldn't even hear my guitar. <laughs> it was just her playing the piano, but it taught me how to read music, and that was like a key. It like opened the door. All of a sudden, I could play what the Rolling Stones were playing. I could play what Paul McCartney was playing, and that was the first guitar that, uh, that I had the opportunity to, to, uh, to play. And can I tell the rest of the story then? Yeah, I want to hear it. So... At that age, I was really struggling with what I wanted to do with my life. I was thinking about it in an early age. And there were two places. I, I wanted to do something to make this world a better world. I've always wanted to, in some way, to contribute, just something meaningful. And at that age, there were two places where I saw that happening. One was music. And the very first concert I ever went to was Jefferson Airplane uh, in Memorial Hall in Kansas City, Kansas. And I'm telling this story for a reason. I sat on the front row. Grace Slick was the lead singer. And from the front row, my front row seat, I looked up at Grace on the stage and I said, Grace, I love you. But it came out like, because it was so loud. <laughs> she totally ignored me. She totally blew me off. Yeah. But I'm telling you this now because uh, a publicist uh, that... Uh, I know is working directly with Grace and is, is giving one of my new books to her and she's going to give her the message. So oh. it's, uh, you know, what, 50 years later, but she's, yeah, she's going I love to that story. the message. But, the sad, but, but think about this. I saw, I saw in that concert, I saw probably 50,000 people being moved mm -hmm. by what was happening mm -hmm. on that stage. Mm -hmm. And the only other place that I saw it at that time, uh, Billy Graham, the evangelist, and I'm, I'm not saying identify with the message, but I was fascinated by what was happening. Billy Graham filled stadiums, 70,000 people. And it was one man speaking. He wasn't even playing a guitar. And he moved those people. He moved their hearts and their souls. But here's the difference. What I hear, that's not me. Not me. It's your butt. You know, there's a lot of energy in this room. Yes, there, there truly is. What I, what I saw was this. When the people left the concert, of any, any concert, it wasn't just a Jefferson Airplane, they longed for the experience again, and they needed an album or later a tape, an eight-track tape, to recreate the experience. When Billy Graham, when the people left that stadium, he had said something that changed the way they felt in their hearts and the way they thought about themselves and the way they looked at the world. And that change lasted without them needing the reinforcement. Mm -hmm. So I, I had to make a choice early on. I said, am I going to do something speaking or am I going to do music? And I decided to do both. And I've tried both different times in my life. So if this whole author gig doesn't work out, I want you to know I've got a plan B backup, all right? <laughs> and we're, we're going to get to that, but I just want you to know we, that. We will. So I, that was the very first guitar that you're seeing there. The very first one. And that was my mom, my younger brother, uh, and a, a neighbor of ours. Let's put that, um, that picture back, Carl. Yeah, it was a neighbor of ours that, that was a good friend uh, at the time when my dad was, was not in the family, and obviously it was a Christmas, yeah. Christmas image. That was a Christmas present for me. And that's a happy Greg right there. 
I've got a couple of um, just pictures of you, some, right. some things. And okay. so let's go to the next one. <laughs> when was this? And this, you know, these are not necessarily in order. Yeah, this, yeah. I don't know the exact year for this. I, I remember this interview. This was done at the Omega Institute in um, uh, New York State, upstate New York. And I had gone to do a, a weekend seminar, and uh, they asked me to do a, an interview. It's like a Charlie Rose kind of interview, what Charlie Rose interviews used to be like. Yeah. And, uh, and that was an image. They asked me a question, and I was giving a very passionate answer. And that was the, uh, the snapshot they, they, gave during, uh, they took during, during that answer. What happens during videos, especially to you in the snapshots, there's some of the worst photos that you can ever ask for. Your mouth, my mouth, Your is, mouth is open. Your mouth is open. Like, yeah, all that let's, look at a, let's look at a younger Greg. Well, I, want, um, I want to say something about oh, this picture. Let's not. Let's, yeah. um, <laughs> you know, we're, we're not necessarily in order here. No. And I, I do know what year this was. This was 2004, and the reason I know... Can I tell another story? Oh, yeah. My That's father, why we're here. My father left when I was 10, uh, had a powerful impact on my life. I didn't know him very well. And we never really talked through the years. In 2003, December of 2003, I was taking a group to India for the first time. And you've just been there. Mm-hmm. And we checked, uh, we went in, t- uh, it was uh, Los Angeles International Airport, the Bradley Terminal uh, at LAX is where we were departing from. I just checked my entire group in at the ticket counter, and now we had some free time. And I was walking down this concourse, and some of you probably know where this is. There is a bank of pay telephones that's still there, one of the few places that still has pay telephones. And I walked past those phones, and something, it didn't pull me, it yanked me, it grabbed me. And I I just could not keep walking, and I turned around and I thought, what in the world is going on? And as I walked over, my dad's image popped into my mind. And it, you had to have quarters. And I reached my briefcase. I happened to have a couple of quarters. My father did not believe in technology. He didn't have an answering machine. If he wasn't there when you called, he didn't get a message or anything. Uh, and I called, and my dad picked up the phone. Hmm. And it was the first time I had talked to him in years and years and years. The backstory of this is uh, my father and never called me son. All right, so that's going to be important here. Uh, so I talked to him. I said, Dad, I'm taking a group to India. And when I come home, I've got a book tour through your city, through Kansas City, Missouri. When I'm there, would you like to have dinner together? He said, yes, son, I would like to have dinner with you. I came back from India, got in about two o'clock in the morning. At eight o'clock that morning, my brother called me and my father had died. So we never had our dinner. But the fact that he called me son before we had that, to me, was the closure. And if I had not followed my intuition and turned around and put those quarters in that phone, I never would have talked to my father before he left this world. So I'm, I'm sharing that story. When you get that hit, mm-hmm. listen to that hit because it's, it's there for a reason. It's really true. And I give thanks. Yeah. All that's just so thankful that I had the presence of mind to make that call and that we had that communication. And for me, for me, that was the closure. That was probably better than the dinner. Let's look at a, uh, another photo here, and that's a younger Greg coming up. Oh, yeah. So, I'm, okay, I remember this photo really well, and I'll tell you why I remember. I had just written a book that was called Awakening the Zero Point. Anybody read Awakening oh, the yeah. Zero Point? And I was doing a photo shoot in Seattle, Washington for the cover of that book. And we were in a, a studio that was um, in a residential area, and there was this huge, there was a hurricane-like storm blowing through Seattle while we were doing this shoot. And the winds, they were telling, they had evacuation orders, they were telling people, get out of your home, you know, go find a safe area and all this. And the guy I was with says, nope, we got to keep shooting, we got to keep shooting, you know. So all of a sudden, the power went out in the house. So we had none of these lights, we had the, everything. And the photographer, he took these huge jumper cables and he, he hooked jumper cables up to the battery in the driveway so he could drive the lights so he could finish this photo shoot. So in the picture, can I see the picture again, please? In this picture, I'm looking out through a plate glass window as the wind is ripping the shingles off of the house across the street. That is, that's what I'm looking at right there. And that's the energy that he captured. That's why I, why I remember it so really, really oh, well. God. Let's, uh, uh, Carl, let's do another one. <laughs> All right. Uh, this was in 2004, 2005. And this is when... Uh, you look I, pensive. Pardon yeah. me? You look pensive. 
Yeah, yeah it was like another there. photo shoot. I don't like photo shoots. Yeah. <laughs> it, it, was, it was hard for me to, to do this photo shoot. But they, I was doing an interview, and they had just asked me a question about a book I'd written called The Divine Matrix. And I was, I was answering the question of the Divine Matrix, and while I was thinking about my answers when he caught that, that picture. Yeah. So that's, that's what happened there. Let's look at the next one. Coming. There we go. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Could, that T-shirt's on purpose, isn't it? That's, you know, yeah. Can oh, you all yeah. see who's, who's on that T-shirt? That's Jimi Hendrix. Okay, That's Jimi so Hendrix. This yeah. picture was taken. Uh, I, uh, I worked in the corporations uh, from late 1970s as a scientist while I was still in college. I was hired without my degree. A lot of people go to school to get the degree so they can get a job. I was hired with my expertise and allowed to go back to school nights and finish, finish my degree. We can talk more about that. And, and this is, I had just started working Cisco Systems. Uh, I was living in Northern California and caring for a friend who was really sick. And I wanted just an easy job. So I applied to a little ad. It didn't tell the name of the company or anything. I applied a little ad in the paper for technical support. I wanted tech, just, you know, phone support. And they said, well, come in for your interview at 6 o'clock at night. I did. Uh, they said, well, you've got a job. They said, but you're overqualified for tech support. We'd like you to be a manager. And I said, a manager of what? And they said, of, of technical operations. And I said, technical operations of what? And they said, for this company. And I said, there is no name of the company even in the ad. I have no idea who I'm even interviewing for. And this was uh, in Palo Alto, California. He says, a company called Cisco. And I said, well, what is Cisco? Because that was before Cisco mm -hmm. was what Cisco is today. And he told me what they were doing, and he said, we need a, a technical operations manager. And I said, well, who's doing it now? And he says, we don't have one. He said, we would like for you to be our first technical operations manager. We'll give you 30 days and a secretary to pull together a plan. How can we support a Cisco router in Jakarta within 60 minutes if it goes down? I said, let me think about it. That picture, I took a vacation to northern New Mexico to think about whether or not I wanted to, to take that job. And uh, I got my hair cut, obviously. And I was uh, exploring music, obviously. <laughs> and this is taken, actually, uh, my first trip into Taos, New Mexico, where I now live and I have for, you know, since uh, the mid-1980s, uh, when I was making the decision if I was going to take that job at Cisco or not. So this is a very important moment in my life. And also, you can tell it's the Don Johnson look. Remember Miami Vice? Yeah, yeah. yeah. That was this, that right. was the uh, that was in the '80s. Well, I'm a little slow on the uptake. That was a holdover in, into uh, in the '90s. Okay. I've got a, the next picture is not of you. It's just of something I want you to talk about. So yeah, this one. What oh, well, what is this? This is um, all right. We are skipping around. Yes. Uh, before I had that job at Cisco, I worked in the city, well, near where I am right now. We're in Thornton, Colorado. I worked in South Denver, Colorado during the Cold War years, uh, late, uh, mid, late 1980s. And I worked in the defense industry. And while I was on vacation, uh, I'm just going to tell you the story. I, I don't tell this story. I was living in Denver and really struggling with what was happening in the world, the Cold War, the, the possibility of two superpowers with hundreds of thousands of nuclear weapons aimed at one another, and I was really struggling with this. And I've always known, I've always studied ancient civilizations, ancient technologies, and I've always believed that if we look, if we know where to look in the past, we will find the key to transcend in the present the conditions that led to the great wars and the suffering that we have seen in our world, including the Cold War. So I woke up from a dream in Denver, Colorado. I was living in Denver, Southeast Denver, I-25 and Arapahoe Road, if you know where that is. I woke up and I was saying the words Taos, Taos, and I had no idea what Taos was. So I went to work that morning and I asked my coworkers, you guys know where Taos, Colorado is? And they said, I well, never heard of Taos, Colorado. And they were looking on the maps, it wasn't there. And a guy next to me had just bought a brand new Toyota Ford Runner and took it on a test drive to northern New Mexico. And he said, oh, we went through a town called Taos, New Mexico. Maybe that's what you're thinking of. So that weekend, I got in the car and I drove to Taos, New Mexico. Uh, and I found this property where I now live 
There's a whole story about who owned it and how it came to be. I don't know if we want that whole story or not. But this, this is looking out my living room window at the land uh, that I found in 1986 uh, that I, I now own. And I'll just tell you, many of you know uh, you are the teacher, Drumvalo Melchizedek. You're familiar with Drumvalo? Yeah. Drumvalo owned this land in the 1980s. And there's a whole story about... Uh, he sold it to someone else. They fell through on the payments. He'd moved to Texas. He needed to get rid of the land. I went to New Mexico. I hadn't heard from him. I called him. I said, what are you doing? He said, I need to sell this land. I said, boy, I got a great deal for you. And we, we, uh, we did the exchange. And so that is a view. That's the view I look at. When I'm on my home in Taos, that's what I look at out in the morning. That's great. Well, when I left the corporations, I asked myself a question. I said, do I want to move to another big city where everything is convenient? Or do I want to wake up somewhere every morning where I'm surrounded by beauty. And beauty has always been a very powerful mm -hmm. force in my life. I'm a triple Cancerian, if you know what that means. Uh, all my planets are in the 12th house. They're all in the sign of Cancer. And, and beauty is a force of nature with me. And, and the Tibetans told us this. It is actually a force of nature. And so for me, I'd lived in Kansas City. I'd lived in Denver. I'd lived in San Francisco. And... Um, the pendulum swung the other way, and I bought a piece of property that was so rustic and needed so much work and still needs so much work, uh, but it's a, a labor of love because it is such a beautiful place to live. I think once I, I actually called you for some reason, and you were, I knew you were home, yeah. and whoever answered says he's out mending fences. Well, this is, this is the thing. <laughs> was really... we, we get emails. My office manager, yeah. uh, I just, I've celebrated this January's 22 years with my office manager who now lives in South Florida. She used to live in New Mexico, uh, close by. And um, she gets emails and phone calls and letters from people that want to apprentice with me. And they say, we want to come and live with you and study with you. And they think I wake up in the morning and I go out and I ohm and meditate, you know, all day yeah, long. Sure. I said, you know, if you want to come and help me fix the fences yeah. around the land, <laughs> And uh, we've always got roofs that need repairing and the wells always need work. I said, I said, come on out. And I never hear from him again. I never hear from him again. I've never had any offers that people wanted to come and play and channel with me. I, that's not, it's not the same. I've got, I've got one more picture on this series. Okay. So, Carl, will you show this? I love this picture. Oh. This, this is the only time I've ever, ever seen you in white. I, you know, I wear, I actually wear a lot of white. It depends yeah. on where I am. When I'm in Mexico, certainly. Yeah. Uh, we go down to teach in Cancun. I've got if the, the very few clothes I'm wearing. They are usually light colored clothes. Mm -hmm. This picture was taken not far from where we are right now. Before the company Gaia was called Gaia, it was called Gaian, G-A-I-A-M. Uh, it was formed in the early 1990s by a, a visionary, an amazing visionary man who's exactly the same age I am, and we were both competitive runners at the same time. I was a competitive runner for 20 years. And um, he held a conference in 1995, and from that conference opted to create one video in 1996. And this was the video that was created. I was the first project that Gaia filmed uh, and it was on work based upon a book called Walking Between the Worlds that is now out of print. But uh, that's what that was all about. And I had a live studio audience for two days, 1996, in, um, and that was in Boulder, Boulder, Colorado. Yep. I've got some things to, um, we're going to get away from the pictures now, things to ask you. Oh. This has to do with uh, your education. I know, I know some things that you probably don't know I know. And of course, uh, I kind of tune in. You know, right. like, and so yeah. I, I know that when you were small about something, uh, first of all, when you were very small, I know that you wanted to be a scientist from the age of four. Yeah. And I can't even fathom that. When I was four, I wanted to be Batman and I had a teddy bear. I mean, that was it. So, I mean, and here you were thinking about science and all this. Well, what this led to, and this you may not know, I know this, you had, and you can explain this. I'm going to give a, a few things for you to explain for us. Right. You had a secret lab in your basement. Okay. Okay. Um, you built a time machine that frightened your classmates. I did. And you, and you issued radiation survival suits. Is this correct? <laughs> okay, so... so where, do you, where do you start with this? I was, I was born in Missouri, and we, uh, we moved to northern Missouri. Uh, Kansas City, Missouri uh, is divided by a river, the Missouri River. There's north and south of the river. We lived north of the river. 
in uh, single family housing. It was, it was the only new house before my parents actually divorced while we were in this house. And they have basements in homes there because tornadoes. We have tornadoes every year. My first tornado I saw from, from this house, from this basement. I, we were in the basement and our dog was not with us. And I ran out of the basement upstairs while the tornado was passing overhead. Was your dog Toto? My dog was Sparky. Oh, Sparky. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and I jumped out the back door and I looked and I stopped in my footsteps. I'd never seen anything so frightening and so beautiful at the same time. Yeah. So the tornado, the eye of this tornado was moving right over our housing development and it was at sunset. So the eye of the tornado was clear and I was looking up through these slate blue and weird green skies that tornadoes create up through this perfectly circular opening where the sunset was this deep red and orange. And when you're in the eye, it's completely still. It's humid, absolutely still, no birds singing or anything. And I stopped and I looked up and you could see this happening. And all of a sudden, my dad was with us then. He came and he grabbed me and took me back downstairs into the basement. Into the basement is where, as a young mad scientist, I created a laboratory that I added on to every year for much of my childhood. At Christmas time, in our house, we would get a J.C. Penney's or a Sears catalog. And my mom would say, what would you like for Christmas? And it was easy for me because there were exactly two pages of science in the whole catalog. And you know, everything else was, you know, everything else. And they had these sets. They had a chemistry set, a biology set, a rock collection set, the, you know, microscope, telescope. So I would check one off, and every year I'd get a new something, and I would add to my existing set, and the laboratory got bigger and bigger and bigger. And there were Bunsen burners, and there were, it always smelled like sulfur and ultraviolet lights and flasks and test tubes. And, and I had a menagerie, a, a collection of creatures. I had a collection of black widow spiders. And so they would live. I poked holes in the top of the container they were in, not knowing that they were about to hatch and the baby black widows would come out oh, through the top and infest my entire basement. That, oh, God. That was, uh, so we had this laboratory and I had it for years and I learned, um, yeah, you know, when I was four years old and my mom remembered this story uh, when she could communicate with me, you know, uh, when she had her memory. And she said, uh, she and her, my father at that time, they took me to a museum in, uh, in Kansas City, Missouri. It's on the plaza. It's called the Nelson Gallery of Art. And there's probably one person in this room that knows right where that is, the Nelson Art Gallery. But it was more than art. It was an archaeological museum, and there was an entire Egyptian section. And I disappeared one day, and they couldn't find me for a couple of hours. And I heard my name over the PA system. They were looking for me, and they found me. I had found the Egyptian section. Mm. And I was glued to a case, eye-locking with a mummy, that was right there. It was the first time at four years old I'd never seen one. And it, just something clicked about ancient civilizations in the past. Uh, and when my mom had to go to work after my father left, uh, we stayed with, with a friend who had a library in their basement. And he had an entire section on Egyptian archaeology and hieroglyphs. And I spent the summer months copying the hieroglyphs and learning the translations and what it was that they meant. But to understand that, I had to understand chemistry, I had to understand geology, and it all worked together really, really well. Where did the time machine come? Time machine. When I was in school, I, I was an inventor, and sometimes my inventions, you've heard <laughs> the saying, it's better to, to look good than feel good. Sometimes my inventions look better than they actually worked. Uh -huh. So I, I had a gadget I put together, and it had real knobs and real dials and real vacuum tubes and a light bulb that came on, <laughs> and it had this little dial, and in my mind, if I turned that dial, we would go back in time. Mm. So I took it to school one day, and I had it under my desk. And we weren't supposed to bring things like, it's illegal to bring time machines to school. They don't like that. So there was a girl sitting in the, in the, in the desk next to me, and she was petrified that I was going to, to turn the switch on. And throughout the day, I would pull it out, and I'd go. And she'd go, no, no. <laughs> Where, well, what? Go the radiation from, suit. Go from that to radiation suits. Yeah, yeah. the radiation suits. So it is really hot and humid in Missouri in the summers. I think some of you probably know that. So in 100 plus degree heat, uh, I was buying raincoats, little yellow raincoats <laughs> with the hoods and the whole thing, uh, and selling them as radiation suits to protect <laughs> us from the radiation of the Cold War. So if you guys are old enough, do you remember we were told in case we see a mushroom cloud, go underneath your desk and That's go right. like this? That's you know? right. 
That's duck right. and roll. So this was, this was supposed to help during the, the, the Cold War. I, I, <laughs> I was an entrepreneur, a young entrepreneur. What can I, I, say? I remember this so vividly, just, just for a moment. I can remember this because I, I would talk, thinking later how ridiculous it was, is that they sounded the alarm in case the mm -hmm. missiles were flying, and you were supposed to get under your desk like, yep, that'll do it. I mean, it like, you know, oh my God, I don't want to look at Tommy. He didn't get under his desk. You know, kind of thing. So I don't know like, what they like were going to do any good. Maybe it's just so that, I don't know, to scare us. It'd be better if they said nothing. Well, I think it was so we felt like we were doing something. I, I agree. Yeah. Um, so your first, your first uh, when you were young, your first job, and then not, not as a pro, what did you do when you were, when you were a kid? Yeah, we, we became poor really, really fast. When my father left, my mom hadn't worked for a long time. She was thrust back into the workforce without a college degree as a woman. In the 60s, uh, we lived in uh, government-subsidized housing, uh, low-income housing, and, uh, and we needed money. And so the, the very first job I had, I was a babysitter, uh, and I babysat, I was 12 at the time, and I babysat a family of seven, and two of them were in diapers. Oh, no. And the mother was a paralegal who traveled seven days at a time. So I was with seven kids during the week all the meals, all the clothes. I don't have any kids of my own now. Maybe this is the reason why. Maybe I, so. I, have them, I have them all in my system. Uh, but I brought home pretty good money as, as a babysitter. Um, I lied about my age and went to work at a... Um, want to talk about the next job? Yeah, yeah. So the first real job, uh, when I was in high school, uh, in a little downtown area, North Kansas City, some of you know where that is, there was a, a fabric warehouse, uh, and they, they had, I was going to, to high school full-time days, and then we get off at 3.30 in the afternoon, 3, 3.30. And this job started at 4 o'clock, and it would go 4 to midnight, but usually, it, actually, it went even later. Um, and my job, there were only two of us in there, and my job, our job, they had this big contraption. It was a fabric warehouse, and the fabric stores would send in their orders, and our job was to take these big bolts of fabric and put them on the smaller bolts that you find and load them on the pallets and load those pallets onto the trucks so the trucks could pull out at six o'clock in the morning and that was and sometimes we worked till five or six in the morning and then I would go to school later on but the redeeming factor of, of the whole time uh, we were both musicians and we smuggled in a turntable and two speakers and we only had two vinyl albums at that time, and we listened to them over and over and over and over again for a year. We only had two albums <laughs> every night. One of them was Yes, uh, Roundabout, and the other one was Alice Cooper, School's Out. They both came out at the same time. Uh, so that, that job was the first paying job, but down the street from that was a copper mill. It's called Whitaker, Whitaker Cable. Some people know, uh, I think the company's gone out of business. It was a copper mill, and it was a union shop. Uh, uh, the Association, American Association of uh, Machinists and Aerospace Workers was what it was. I lied about my age. I'm not proud of that. Um, applied for a job. They, they turned me down. And I went down there every single week. And I gave them the same resume that I typed on my typewriter. And I think, honestly, I think they just got so tired of seeing me, they just gave in. And they gave me a job, uh, a union job. Hmm. And um, where I made really, really well, at that time, it was good money. This is in the 70s. We we're making like 20 bucks an hour. That was, that was good money yeah. in the 70s. And um, I had that job up until the time I left and, and went to college. And it was, you know, it was a, a tough job. It was uh, a copper factory. It, was a, it averaged about 120, 125 degrees in this factory. OSHA came in, and they kept telling the company to turn it down. You know, we had to wear overalls and steel-toed shoes and ear protection and head protection, eye protection steel uh, gloves yeah. for, you know, fingers, and it, it was a tough job. But, uh, and I worked the, uh, the shift uh, 4 p.m. to 4 a.m. They were 12-hour shifts. So I worked that shift and made really good money and saved enough to go to my first college. That was how that happened. So tell me about college. Well, while I was working that shift in northern Missouri, northern Kansas City, I went to junior college, um, Maplewoods Community College. It was a junior college. It took me three years to get through my, my two-year degree. Uh, majored in associate, associate in Applied Science with an emphasis in, in geology. And, uh, and from that, I transferred to FIT, Florida Institute of Technology, in northern Florida uh, to be an oceanography major. Majored in marine biology, marine geology. 
Uh, and from there transferred, well, it was really humid and hot in Florida, and I didn't do well there. <laughs> so I, I went and I said, what is the highest altitude college in the lower 50 states where I could get a degree in geology? And everybody said, well, that's easy. It's in Fort Collins, Colorado, Colorado State University. And I said, okay. So I applied, I was accepted, and that was my sole criteria for going to CSU. Uh, and um, I was at, in CSU, and I was recruited. This was during the first energy crisis. All my jobs have been about crises. The first one was the energy, first energy crisis in the 70s. Some of you may remember, they rationed us 10 gallons mm -hmm. of gas a mm -hmm. week. If you've got a 69 Pontiac GTO, that's not going to get you very far, which is what I had. Uh, Block and a half. So Phyllis Petroleum hired me because I had a background in computer science and uh, as a geologist. And they said, we'll pay for you to finish school if you'll come and, and work for us. So I, I went to Denver and began working with Phillips uh, and finished school in, in Denver. Uh, so I did get a degree, but I didn't need the degree to get the job. Mm. So that was kind of the way. Uh, we can talk about um, yeah. um, a little more in length about your jobs. Yeah. Let's, I want to talk about uh, change. And this is um, now that they've known you as a kid and your first jobs and, and you're, you're going through your work <clears throat> in your college. Well, when it comes to the change of life, and this is what I mean about how you think and things that might have impacted you, mm. um, let's start early. What, what was your first and biggest trauma? Well, as an adult, I have to say my first trauma, I didn't know it at the time, but it mm. was losing family, having the breakup of family, mm -hmm. obviously, was, was a trauma mm -hmm. for me. And um, everybody deals with things like that differently. I miss my family, so I tried to recreate my own through yeah. my relationships, and I started relationships very early. My very first relationship, uh, I was 12, and she was 11, and we stayed together until I was 16. She was 15, and my next one was 16 until I was 23. And, um, you know, those are, those are tough times. Those are long-term relationships mm -hmm. when you're that young. So I essentially grew up together. Uh, my very first one, the, the woman, the girl that I was with, she was a babysitter for a woman that had three kids, Shelly, Sean, and Shannon. I remember them now. <laughs> and that woman would leave for a week at a time and ask the babysitter to stay with the three kids and ask me to stay so there was a man in the house <laughs> at 13 uh, or 12. And uh, so we essentially had a family. I mean, we had three kids we cared for. It was the summer months out of school. We took them to the park. We fixed all the meals. We watched TV. We did movies. You know, we did all that. Are, but, you, are you a cook now? But I'm a, I, I can cook. Mm -hmm. uh, I cook really well a limited number of things. Mm -hmm. It's a pretty, some people think it's a boring diet. It works really well for me. Yeah. Uh, almost every meal, broccoli, rice, some form of rice, some form of broccoli or Brussels sprouts, uh, and some form of, of right. usually a soy-based protein. Of now that's not or, what you were cooking for the kids. Uh, back then, I was, I was cooking rice. Were you uh, rice? Yeah, right. we were cooking rice and vegetables. No hot dogs. So, no hot dogs. Oh, no, okay, no, fine. No, we right. didn't. What happened on the morning of your 21st birthday? Ah. Uh, you asked me that one. <laughs> so the morning, okay, so now I'll share things that I don't typically share. Thank you. <laughs> uh, about some of my habits. When my parents divorced, uh, as a musician, I began playing in a band, a number of bands. Uh, it was illegal for me to go into the clubs because I was underage. So they would smuggle me in, stand me up on the stage, I would play my guitar, and then they'd smuggle me back out. And when you're in the band, everybody, when they take a break, everybody's smoking a cigarette and drinking coffee or a beer or Coke or whatever. I, so I started smoking uh, at the age of 14. And I smoked about a pack. And all through when I was working in the factory, everybody smoked. And you could smoke on the job. Uh, on my 21st birthday, and I remember this so well, I woke up the morning of my 21st birthday, and the world felt different. It looked different. My body felt different. And I got out of bed that day, and, uh, and I was. I, was dry. I had a 1969 Pontiac GTO. It was white with a black vinyl top, Rochester four-barrel carburetor, completely stock. I mean, Four on the floor. Beautiful. No, it was automatic. It was actually it was automatic. automatic? Yeah. And um, <laughs> I woke up that morning, and I said, I'll never have another cigarette. And I stopped that day. And on the visor of my Pontiac GTO, I put a pack of Marlboros unopened. Mm -hmm. And I said, if I ever want one, they're right there. And until I sold that car, the, that pack was there, and I've never had one since. I woke up that morning, I stopped smoking, I began distance running. 
And I didn't have the shoes to do it. I just went out for a run. Uh, I went down the street to a, a, a shopping mall and enrolled in martial arts. And I started Mondays and Wednesdays was karate, Tuesdays and Thursdays was judo. And it all, I mean, that week, that day I felt different than that week. My whole, that set in the motion things that stayed with me until this very moment. Martial arts, um, running, I'm not a competitive runner anymore, but I was in Denver. When I was here in Denver, I ran on the corporate teams. I did triathlons and ran for Phyllis Petroleum for Martin Marietta. You did some swimming. Uh, in, the, in the triathlons, I did the running and the swimming. I didn't yeah. do the biking. So I did yeah. two of the three events as a, a, corporate, a corporate team. Things I never got to do in high school because I was working after school. I never did any intramurals. I never got to do any of that stuff. So, so I kind of got to go back and, and, and do it later. And things that, that no one would ever imagine, I would imagine, uh, I, I would think. Um, watercolors, wood carving. Yeah. Well, I, <laughs> I will say my father was an artist. And he was a really good artist. Uh, and I used to watch him a lot. He was an oil painter. Uh, I learned from watch. He didn't teach me, but I learned from watching him. Um, wood carving. I still, I still do, I'm a, I do watercolors. I do oils. I do charcoal, pastel, uh, wood carving. I don't do it actively now because I'm on the road doing other things, but I still consider myself an, an artist. And I, I always think, I live in one of the largest artist communities in North America, Taos, Santa Fe. We're surrounded by artists. And I keep thinking, if this gig as an author doesn't work out, <laughs> and my plan B as a musician doesn't work out, plan C will be to go back to doing the art. <laughs> ceramics, I love doing ceramics. Let's talk about music. Um, All right. Carl, let, we have another set going. Let's do picture one. And we're gonna, I want you to see the pictures and uh, tell me about them. All right. <laughs> <laughs> uh-huh. Uh-huh. OK. Uh -huh. So this was my second guitar. You look pensive again. Were you being interviewed? No, I was oh, being I photographed, and I didn't like it. Uh, this is my second guitar. And I had played in bands. I played in country bands. I played in rock bands. I played in a blues band. Uh, and what I found, the hardest, actually the easiest thing about, that some of you, if you're musicians, you all know this. The easiest thing about being in a band is being on the stage to play the music. The hardest thing is keeping everybody's life together long enough to get onto the stage. So I, I remember, for example, in a band, on the way to the Battle of the Bands, we had to go by the jail to bail out the drummer so he could play long enough to get us the money so we could win the Battle of the Bands and pay his bail. So I mean, just cra you know, crazy stuff like that. So that photograph, uh, I decided, I made a big decision. Um, that was right about 1974 is when that is. And I went solo acoustic. I said, I'm going to play solo acoustic. alone. All right. And um, I was on my way to 74. I had I've been accepted, but I, I hadn't gone to FIT yet. So that probably was taken in Kansas City, Missouri. Let's do another one. Next. Yeah. Great guitar. All right. Flutes. Yeah. How so many flutes do you have right now? Right now, I'm not sure. But right. we... Um, more than 10. More than 10. In, more than 20. More than 20. Right. Absolutely. Right. 1986, I had my first opportunity to actually explore some of the places that I had seen as a child, uh, ancient civilizations, uh, and took my first trip into Tibet. And from that, it led to Peru, that led, I'm sorry, I went to Egypt, 86. It led to Peru, that led to Tibet, ended up going into Nepal, Bolivia, all through the American desert southwest, um, India. And what I began to find was every culture I went to, there are two things they all had in common, and I love both of them. They all drink tea, and I collect tea from all over the world. I love tea, I love, I love to know how it's made, I love to know what it's grown from, I love the taste of it. Uh, and every culture has a flute. And what I found was, even if I didn't know the language, if I had a flute, I could walk into a market in Cairo and start playing a flute. Mm -hmm. Or I've, I've done this, I could walk into a market uh, in Cusco, Peru. And I walked into a market one day, I didn't know a soul, and started playing a flute. And a man in a music store brought out a harp. And he was playing his harp, his name was Flavio. 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 And Flavio was playing the harp. Okay. I, was, and we, I, I didn't know the language when I was there. Now, when and you say harp, you mean harmonica? No, it was a full-size concert five, harp. A concert harp. That he was playing right wow. in the middle of this. Uh, he just pulled it out of his store. Wow. And they recorded it. There's, there's actually recording this. So <laughs> I began collecting flutes. Um, and I taught myself how to play. 
And they're uh, primarily wooden flutes, five hold, six, fold, six hold. The, the softer the wood, the, the richer the sound. The harder the wood, like uh, uh, mahogany and maple and, and spruce, you know, the higher pitch the sound. Uh, and I've continued uh, to do that. Uh, I'm now in the studio. I'm in the studio. I think we might have a picture, so I don't want to get ahead of it here. We'll get there. Yeah, uh, I've got, uh, I took 36 of these flutes into a studio recently. Um, Let's go to the next, the next yeah. slide. I think that, that actually that might, it be a, it might be a studio slide or it might be on stage. I'm not really That's sure. That's me. Okay, this is a five-hold cedar flute uh, that I'm playing on the stage in um, Fe uh, uh, Scottsdale, Phoenix, uh, right. Scottsdale, Arizona. Okay is where I am. And um, the interesting thing about a flute, a lot of people think the sound comes out through the end. So people are always trying to hold a mic to the end of the flute. That's not where the sound <laughs> comes from. It comes from overhead. So you always see me, I'll take a mic and I'll put it right up over the top of, of the sound hole. Mm -hmm. uh, sometimes I play solo, I accompany uh, other people. I recently was in the studio with uh, a really well-known singer-songwriter, Jenny Bird. Some of you know, she toured uh, with the Lilith Fair, all women's tour and worked with uh, Paula Cole and Jewel and the Indigo Girls. And I just went in the studio with her about three weeks ago with a couple of flutes. And she's releasing that CD this spring. She asked me to play it on the, on the CD release party. So, so I still I play it. Uh, some of you may have seen, uh, some of you may have seen me play at some of the events that we do. I, I do use the wooden flutes sometimes. Yeah. We try to make you... Uh bring your flutes every time we have a, a, a client conference. And, and you know, the invitation is again. Well, well I appreciate it. You know, it's yeah. gotten harder. Security has changed ah. in the airports. So last time, I mean, this is, this is what they're doing now. They x-ray the flute in my bag and they'll say, what is this? And I'll say, it's a flute. And they'll say, well, how do we know it's a flute? And I say, <laughs> well, there are a number of ways that we can determine this. Uh, you can tell that there's nothing in there but wood, or you could let me touch my bag and pull it out, and I will play it for you. So I will pull out the flute and do a little concert at TSA, <laughs> and they say, okay. So, but it's just, they're just not as, as easy to travel with it as they used to be. Yeah. Let's go to the next one. Oh, this, uh, okay, so I collect guitar. Twice in my life, I've gone through a point where I've given everything in my life away, uh, including all my guitars. And when I left Denver, <clears throat> um, when I left Denver, I, <laughs> uh, I left a job. I left a lot of friends, uh, relationship issues, and I ended up just, I gave everything away. Uh, maybe you've done this before. It's a very freeing feeling. But I, I started missing my guitars. So I recently have started recollecting guitars. This particular guitar, all guitars that I've ever had were made out of wood, and I love the sound of wood. This one does not have a speck of wood on it. Uh, it is made from the material, recycled blades of military helicopters, the stuff that they're made out of. Hmm. Uh, it is carbon fiber composite, and it has, uh, it's an acoustic electric guitar. I can plug it in and play at an outdoor festival. I can play it in a room like this without any. It, it is the most beautiful sound. I love playing behind this, mm -hmm. this instrument. And this is, I'm doing a, a solo gig here. Uh, I don't have it ready to release yet, but I am doing a, a singer-songwriter solo CD. And this was a song from... Uh, uh, what's going to be the title? Do you know yet? I don't know the title. It keeps okay. changing. Maybe we'll, we'll have a contest. We'll have a contest. What's the title of Great CD? Okay, <laughs> okay next, uh, the next one. What's happening here? Well, uh, I have been asked to play behind other people who are doing things. This is a very well-known poet. Uh, her name is Nina Hart. She's a published poet. She's living in Asheville, North Carolina right now. She came to Taos, New Mexico, uh, in Santa Fe. This was in Santa Fe. She is doing a reading, and I'm playing behind her. At the, what a beautiful venue. Isn't that an awesome-looking venue? Yeah. Yeah, it's a, it's a really beautiful place. So I'm playing while she is, is reading the, the poetry. Let's do one more. Actually, a couple more, but let's do this one. Yeah. That's me playing fast. <laughs> <laughs> I know, which, it's a little blurry. Sa but, yeah, it's yeah. the same guitar, but that's, same that's guitar. the action shot. And okay. the, the guitar is black. It is. Because it's the right it's, color. It's, it's of the composite that you it talked is, about. That is the composite. It's the same one. It's a beautiful, beautiful yeah, this guitar. Next, this next, though, go ahead and, uh, and show it, Carl. This has a story behind it. And oh, who, yeah. who's that person you're with? So this is a very well-known, a Grammy Award-winning composer, beautiful man, a dear brother, dear, dear friend. His name is Barry Goldstein. So I'm sure some of you know Barry Goldstein. He's got his own meditation CDs that you may... He does different kinds of music. He has a meditation CD. One is called Ambiology, like biology with A-M in front of it, Ambiology. 
Uh, but we're in a studio here, and he invited me to come in. We're taking a break, listening to a playback, and I've got uh, the native flutes there. And we are in the process right now. We have native flute CD that I will be wrapping uh, next month in February in Arizona. This is a secret underground studio. Nobody knows where this is because it's underneath uh, a professional building. I can't tell you what it is or it wouldn't be secret. So when we go, nobody knows we're in this studio and it's an awesome studio. I love, I love recording here and we could stay here till the week. I am a night person, either late night or early morning. Most of my books are written between about 11 at night and three, four o'clock in the morning. Uh, unfortunately, I've never needed a tremendous amount of sleep. So I, I do need sleep. If I get six really good hours, I'm, I'm really good. If I get more than that, I get a little groggy. So that's why working in the factory when I was in school and doing the recordings, writing the books, um, it works well not to need a lot of sleep. And Let's do one more in the music. Uh, one, more, more? one more shot. Yeah. Okay. Well, I'm playing uh, behind another. You may recognize this person if you've ever been into the Hay House when the Hay House was having a series of uh, conferences called I Can Do It. Some of you went to the I Can Do It conferences. This is the woman, the organizer, Nancy Levin, who was also a poet in her own right and has left that gig to become a poet and an author and teach workshops in her own right. And uh, this was in Fort Lauderdale, Fort Lauderdale, no, um, Orlando, Florida. And she asked me to play behind her while she debuted uh, one of her poems for the first time. So I was very honored and had a good time doing it. There's a YouTube video of this. That's why that little click is on there. If you could do, well, I just want to say this. Some of you asked me about this, if I have any videos, I've got about 30 pages of YouTube videos that are not mine. They're bootleg that other people put up, so I have no way to control the quality. I, I can't control the quality of the content, but if you want to see some of these old, old programs, and if you want to see that uh, video with Nancy, that is, that is up there. Yeah. I want to get into some uh, heavier things now. And the uh, Martin Marietta, you've told us about that. Now, at Martin, I happen to know that you're working with the Star Wars program. Yeah. Um, one of the things that you were connected to, and you t tell me if I'm wrong, the Peacekeeper missile, is that right? Is this the one that they now call the MX, or they, <coughs> yeah. they were calling the yeah, MX? That was it. And at that juncture in your life, when you were making missiles, <laughs> Greg Braden, missile maker, when you were doing this, you told me one, at one time, I think, uh, that, um, is it the senior President Bush? Yep. that came through on an inspection tour or with some questions, and he had a four-star general yeah. with him, and something happened. You want to tell us what? Yeah, well, first, uh, I just want to back up and, and share this a little bit. I, I applied when Phyllis Petroleum, when the oil industry went bust in Denver, and some of you were living here, remember that. It was a tough time. Uh, they wanted to transfer me to Saudi Arabia, and I didn't want to go to Saudi Arabia uh, to, uh, to Riyadh, to a, with a company called Aramco, uh, Arabian American Oil Company. I didn't want to go. So I applied to Martin Marietta Aerospace because I've been fascinated by space exploration and I wanted to participate and contribute in that. So I applied, they hired me. Uh, they said, you have a job, but you need a security clearance, a secret clearance, and it takes about six months. So they said, we'll give you an unsecured job develop, as a software developer. Uh, until your security clearance comes through. So one day I got called in the personnel. They say, your security clearance came through. They went back. They talked to my kindergarten teacher who was still alive. They talked to my ex-wife's family. I don't know what they said. They talked to my ex-wife. They talked to neighbors. I mean, they are really thorough with these security clearances. And, and the whole idea is they don't care what you do. They just want to make sure they know so it can never be used as leverage against you to blackmail when you're working in a secure environment. So that, that's what the deal was. So I went to the office and they said, okay, you have your assignment. You now have a secret security clearance. And I left and I had this paper and I was walking down the hall and my friend came up. He said, did you get your clearance? I said, yeah. He said, did you get your assignment? And I said, yeah. He said, what is it? And I said, it's peacekeeper. You know, anything to do with peace, I'm all about it, you know? So <laughs> I'm, I'm working on the peacekeeper. And then I stopped and I said, what is the peacekeeper? I had no idea. I said, what is the peacekeeper? And he laughed. He said, that is the MX missile program. And I said, what is the MX missile program? He said, that is the program that we are developing uh, to tip the scales in the Cold War. The MX missile was one missile went up and once it was airborne, it released 10 independently targetable warheads to 10 different cities. And we built 50 of these. 
And, um, and it turned the scales. It, it's insane. It was insane to do, but the war was already insane. So within the insanity of the war, it actually worked and helped tip the scales because the technology was so advanced that nobody could duplicate it. So while that was happening, we were also developing something called SDI, Star Wars Defense Initiative. And the first President Bush came to the Waterton Canyon facility to review. Uh, and it was, uh, I remember the Secret Service coming down three days early, camping out for three days and three nights to secure this area when, when, uh, when he came down. And I went to my desk one day, and I had an invitation. They only had one invitation per department. And I, w I wasn't senior staff, and I had this invitation. And I went to my supervisor, and I said, of all the people, I said, why do I have this? I said, some of your more senior people should have it. He, I remember he said, don't look a gift horse in the mouth, is what he said. He said, take it and use it. So I went, I met, I listened to the speech. I met the first President Bush, and he had a general that was with him. And we got to ask questions. And I asked this general a question. He's a very powerful man. And I said, to be where you are, you has, has, you've paid a very high price in your life, I would imagine. I said, what does it cost you in your life to be at the place and have the power that you have right now? And he looked at me and he called me son, which is very interesting. <laughs> he said, son, he said, to be where I am right now has cost me everything. He said, I've lost my wife because of this career. I've lost my children. I've lost my friends. I've lost my family. He says, I've lost my health. And I said, wow. I said, that is a very high price. I said, if you had to do over again, would you do it again? He says, yes, I would. He said, I, I would do everything I've done and more to be where I am today. And it really struck me. It, he was very conscious about what he had given away to achieve the status that he had. And in his way of thinking, it, what it was worth to him uh, to achieve that. So, so it's very candid, very honest, very candid conversation. Uh, and we developed the SDI. We developed the Star Wars. A lot of people don't know is when they tested it in space, they didn't bring it home. So it's there. If, it's still you know, there. They deployed, yeah. Wow. Yeah. We're about to get into uh, that Greg. Is heavy. That's heavy. That is heavy. All right. We're Let's about ready to get heavy. into um, Greg Braden, the teacher, but still being on the heavy side. Yeah. There had to be, at some point in time, an aha that would take you yeah. from that where you have just described to that which brought you to, I'm going to start teaching, I'm going to, I've got something to say. Uh, I've asked this question a lot. Uh, what was the turning point? And I think for me it was less of a turning point and more of a logical progression because all through my corporate career, I was working at Phillips, I was working at Cisco, I was working at the copper mill, at nights and on weekends, I've always studied the ancient texts, ancient traditions, the scriptures, the Dead Sea Scrolls, the Mahabharata, uh, the archaeological studies. David Hatcher Childress, who now is my friend, I used to read his book mm. when I was a kid. He hitchhiked across the world to study ancient civilizations. So I've always done that. And what happened is they've just shifted priorities. So I now do that full time. But, but the two things that happened, um, there was... Well, I, I want to say after, when I met Bush and, and during that time, the height of the Cold War, and I have to, if you don't remember, behind the scenes, it was a very scary time. We came this close to doing the unthinkable, mm -hmm. the two superpowers, and unleashing nuclear weapons on civilian populations. And, and it disturbed me. When I got my job, peacekeeper, I had, I had sleepless nights. I would lay in bed at night and sweat and say, why me? Why am I here? Why am I doing this job? I've always had a feeling, and I mentioned this before, if we know where to look in the past, that we will find the key to transcend the hate that separates us now and avoid the kinds of wars that we found ourselves in the 20th century and now the 21st century that, that we're in. So, so that, was, that was important for me to... I've always felt that that was the reason I was in that position because I, I learned that world. I learned about the way those people think. I learned how to train military thinking people with new ideas, and I share a lot of those ideas. I, you don't know that, but those are techniques that I use when I'm teaching. But there was one, there was a day, uh, I was still doing my workshops while I was in the corporations. I would do it on weekends. So one Friday afternoon, I had a workshop planned for Saturday, 300 people in, were gonna meet me in a room, we were gonna do a Saturday workshop. 
my supervisor came in at Martin Marietta, and he had a way of doing this. Friday afternoon, he would come in and say, well, men, because it was all men, he'd say, the good news is it's Friday. The really good news is there's only two working days left until Monday. <laughs> Think about that. So that told me that we were working overtime yeah. over the weekend. And I said, well, I can't work this weekend. I'm doing a workshop. And he said something to me. He said, son, I'm going to have to look into that. <laughs> he said, son, you have to make a choice. Are you working for this company or are you working for those people? I said, well, it's a good choice. So I took some time off and I went to Egypt. And two weeks. And when I was in Egypt, I went onto the Sinai Peninsula and I climbed Mount Sinai. I love high elevations. And if there's ever a high place and you're with me on a trip, we're going to climb a mountain. You just know that. And there was a moment when the sun was setting. And if you've ever been to the top of Mount Sinai, there's nothing there. I mean, nothing grows, no plants, no water, no trees, nothing. There's you and the sky and the earth and God, and that's it. And the sun was setting, and as those last rays shot up over the curvature of the earth, I could see it over the desert. It was so beautiful, and, and I'm moved by beauty. And, and this feeling welled up inside of me, and, and I asked myself, for some reason, a question I never asked before. And I said, in this moment, if, if my life ended right now, I, I didn't think it was going to, but I said, if I left this world right now, and I could never come back, and I look back on everything I'd ever done and I could never change a thing, would I feel complete with my life? And before I even got that question out, <clears throat> the answer was welling up inside me. It was no, 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 I wouldn't feel complete. I, there's some things I haven't done. Mm -hmm. So my next question was, what would it take to say yes? What would it take to feel more complete with your life? And the answer to that question became the, the, the guidepost, the yardstick by which I measure every opportunity to this moment that has come to me, a lot of good opportunities, but which one are gonna get me closer to my yes? Mm -hmm. And I went back from that trip, uh, and it wasn't long after that I turned in my resignation, uh, left the corporation and began doing what I'm doing. What was the reaction the of your supervisor at that time? <laughs> Can I, do we have time? Can I tell the story? I want the story. All right, so my supervisor here in Denver, Colorado, I'm gonna tell the whole story because it has a happy ending. He had a corner office with big windows and a big dark wooden desk. And I went back and I told him I was leaving and he, first he was upset and he said, he said, you're crazy. He said, son, I get that a lot. He said, you're on the fast track in this company. Nobody ever told me that. He says, you've got security, you've got insurance, you've got benefits. He said, I love this. He said, all you have to do, all you have to do is ride it out for 30 more years and you're home free. <laughs> 30 more years. So before... <laughs> only, th only 30. Only 30 okay, years. That's good. Before I went into the office, I asked the universe for a sign because, you know, it's a big decision. Am I, am I making the right decision if I leave? And I thought that was my sign. So I said, uh, I said, what? You know, I said, I'm glad that you, you said that because I, I could never work for a, a company where I'm just, my life isn't about riding it out for 30 more years. Well, then everything changed. His whole demeanor changed. He got up from behind that desk. He, we weren't allowed to smoke in the building, but he smoked cigars. So he always had a soggy, unlit cigar in his mouth. It was always there all day long. He came out from behind the desk. He got about this far from my face and that soggy cigar was in his in his mouth and, and his P's and his S's, I was wearing them, you know? <laughs> and, and he was really upset and he took his forefinger and he poked it in my, right in my sternum really hard, ex-military guy. Yeah. He said, son, if you, he took this very personally, if you turn your back on me right now, he says, if you walk out that door, he said, I will personally see to it. Not only will you never work in this department again, he said, not only will you never work in this company, he says, I will blackball your name from this industry. You will never, ever, ever work in this industry again. I said, oh God, thank you. Thank you. I said, because... <laughs> no more Greg Missile Builder. No, I said, no. well, I asked for a sign when I came in and I thought the last thing you said was the sign, but this is the sign because I could never work someplace where this is the thinking, where, where this kind of thinking is here. And, and I left, but I, here's, here's the rest of the story. I came back to Denver a couple of years later, and I did a program. Uh, it was at the Mile High Church in Denver. Some of you are from Mile High Church. And that man was on the front row of the Mile High Church. And he said, because he had to make the same choice a few years later. It doesn't all happen for everybody at the same time. And he said, now I understand what you do, and I understand why you made the choice that you made. He says, I'm glad that you made that choice. 
So a happy ending, and he comes to my programs sometimes now. Uh, he thought I was going to leave and go with a competition. Boeing Computers, BCS, was yeah. a, a competitor. He thought I was going to go work with Boeing. Mm -hmm. So my careers have always been during times of crisis. The energy crisis of the 70s, the Cold War, war crisis of the 80s, the information sharing crisis, uh, the first Gulf War, the 1990s. And, and so people asked me, they said, well, you know, would you ever be an engineer again? And I kind of think we are consciousness engineers, and this is a time of crisis. It's just we're going about a little bit different way. So, so I'm still working in, in crisis mode and, and still problem solving. Uh, just a different application using what I learned in the corporations. And I want to say corporations were good to me. I learned a lot from them. It was a different world. It was a different time. Much different world. Uh, and I would not make a very good uh, yeah. engineer, software engineer right, right now. I right. know that you started slowly. We have this in common with uh, four and five people in the living room and, and mm. all of these things. And, and about the same time, yeah. I think, the time frame. And a harmonic convergence time. That's right, exactly. Uh, Can I, I tell a story about harmonic convergence? Yeah, please. Really quick. I had no idea what harmonic convergence was <laughs> when it was happening here in Denver, Colorado, but I was heavily into music at the time as a software developer. That's 87. 87. Mm -hmm. And uh, people were coming in the office. They were saying, are you going to the harmonic convergence? Are you going to the harmonic convergence? Up in Boulder, you know, Fort Collins, wherever it is, Chaco Canyon. And because I didn't know what it was, you know how your mind assigns a meaning, close, the closest thing that makes sense to what you think you're hearing. As I heard harmonic convergence, I thought they were talking about a rock group, harmonica virgins. <laughs> harmonica virgins? Harmonica virgins. And I thought, I man, see. everybody's going to see this man, concert, that's harmonica that's virgins. Wow. I had no idea what it was. Yeah. But I actually came to harmonic convergence here in, well, there in Boulder, Colorado, <laughs> is, is where I was. So yes, it was about the same time. when, And my very first talk was at the Open Book Door, uh, open door Bookstore in Denver, Colorado. Mm -hmm. The very first, and I didn't have a book. And they they let me come and do a talk without You have a big book. history here. It's just really nice that we've been able to do it here it's, in this area. It's awesome. I, yeah. It's from your work it's to your sure. start. We're going to skip some time. I want to, let's do some more pictures. I'm going to call it people in your life. And right. uh, so, Carl, can we have uh, the first of a series? And we can go through them fast. I don't want to keep people up too late. Uh, that's right. You just tell, tell what they are when you All see right. them and what's, what's happening, because it's more about where they were and what was happening. Uh, audience, than, how are you guys doing? You okay? You all right? Yeah. All okay. right. Just checking in. Just checking in. Right. Just checking in. Okay, right. who, who is this? This is my dear, dear, dear friend, colleague, and spiritual brother, Dr. Bruce Lipton. How many of you have studied with Dr. Bruce Lipton? All right, so a hand for Dr. Bruce Lipton. Yeah. All right, my brother Bruce. <laughs> Biology of Belief. He wrote the book, Biology mm -hmm. of Belief. Bruce and I, we've lost track of how long we've known each other. It's been over 20 years. Mm -hmm. And people used to tell us, before we knew each other, they said, you guys should meet because you look like brothers. I don't really see the connection there, but maybe we did at one time. We both had more hair, longer hair, and bigger beards, I guess. You and Bruce just recently went to the United Nations. Yep. Um, and to hear you say it, and you've, you said this over dinner to me, you gave him a message they didn't want to hear. I've got, uh, Carl, can I have the next picture? Because this is you, I think, and Bruce uh, after that was over. It, this, is, this is the after picture. So Bruce and I were invited. Uh, he is a life sciences major. He's a biologist. I'm a geologist. They invited us to come. And it wasn't like the UN General Assembly, you know, or anything like that. It was a, a, a special group. They were asking for input to know what to prepare for for the next 15 years. Uh, money, resources, preparation, what's happening. They wanted our perspective on what was happening in the world. And as a biologist, Bruce talked to them about cooperation. As a geologist, I talked to them about cycles of time, cycles of human conflict, cycle, cycles of uh, climate change, economic cycles. And, you know, when you say the United Nations, it's not just one organ. There are United Nations within United Nations. And there's some very forward-thinking, new, uh, young, vibrant people that are there that really want to, to address these things head-on. And there's an old guard that is having a hard time with the new thinking in, in the new world. And, and this is what, what we were up against. So I shared a message of cycles, uh, cyclic conflict. Um, we both talked about the fact that nature is based upon cooperation rather than competition. Uh, and when it was over, this was, this was us walking out when it was over, and Bruce is very happy, and I'm very happy. I think we were happy that it was over. <laughs> we got, I have a, a few pictures in a row, and you can just tell us what, what, what's going on. Um, you've done a number of uh, times when you do 
the circles of friends. Let's go to the next one. Sure. This was. Um, this is Joe Dispenza, Dr. Yeah. Joe Dispenza, Dr. Bruce Lipton, and Greg Braden. And this is at a Cryon conference. That's right. Now, I think in Hot let me, Springs. Yes. Let me let me show you another one, All and right. it's very different from this one. Yeah. Go to the next one. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So you probably know you know probably know the story behind this. We the three of us were invited. First of all, we're we're friends. We love one another and we present well together. And it makes sense for us to work together because our work dovetails. Uh, there's some people that it wouldn't make sense with. Uh, we become even better friends. We tour together all over the world, uh, you know, Western Europe and, and rarely do anything here in the States together. Lee invited us to speak at the uh, Hot Springs Conference in 16, right? 2016. And somebody said, oh yeah, the three amigos are gonna show up. Three Amigos, that was a movie, Steve Martin. Anybody remember Three Amigos? Let, let's do, do the next slide. So this happened. <laughs> this, was part of the, this was part of the promo. And from this, Bruce loves, loves to have fun. And Bruce got the sombreros and he brought them. And we rehearsed. <laughs> and we choreographed and we did the Three Amigos dance for the uh, Hot Springs. And when you were done, you threw the sombreros, we threw into, the sombreros the into the audience. Never to be seen again. Damaging as few people as possible. Here's yeah. the next slide, and it's just it's you three again at another, another place. This is, uh, I think this is us in London. And we were doing a QA and a after, um, after, this was at the International Conference on Human Consciousness and Evolution. Perfect conference for the three of us. Uh, it happens every year, and this is us doing a Q&A afterward, and Joe, uh, Joe's saying something, and I love the Bruce's look here. Bruce is like, what? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, but that's what's happening there. Um, next one. This is kind of you. Uh, yeah, you selfie, know, people don't get to see this kind of stuff very no, much. you don't. Bruce and I, we recently spoke together, just the two of us. We did an evening at the Harris Center at Folsom College in uh, Folsom, uh, California. So it's known for Folsom Prison and Folsom College. Yeah. And it's a beautiful, beautiful theater. Uh, we got there early. Uh, there was exactly a thousand seats. They sold exactly a thousand. The fire code wouldn't let it more in. Uh, we were backstage and I think Brucey was a little nervous and we were playing with, and I said, well, I want to do a selfie, but we were surrounded by mirrors. And I said, well, let's do a selfie in the mirror. And you can see that little, I mean, look at his eye. Can we see that again? Look at his eyes. You can see the, both of us. I mean, we, there's little boys in those men. That's right. And we're having a great time. I love this man. He is a brilliant, brilliant man, way ahead of his time. I want to tell you, Bruce was cloning stem cells in the late 1960s and writing the papers on epigenetics before that word became the popular word mm -hmm. that everybody's talking about now. And his work was discounted because it did not fit the model. And that's why he left. He left the, uh, the university. Where he was teaching. Where he was teaching. Uh, I left the corporations where I was working about the same. Bruce, here's what Bruce, Joe, and I have something in common. We were all in academia. We were all in the corporate world to some degree. And we all had to make a decision. Do we stay with the universities, write white papers that are published through peer-reviewed journals that are cool, but very few people will ever see them? Or do we take a very well-researched, rock-solid message directly to a mainstream audience because we need it now? And independently, we each made that the same choice. So it doesn't preclude us from doing the white papers, but there, we don't have the credibility because we don't have universities behind us the way, the way we may have had in the past. Here's somebody that you've talked about in the past. Next, uh, I want you to tell me who's this. All right, this sweetie is my office manager, January of 22 years. We just celebrated 22 years together. Her name is Lori, Lori Wilmot. I met Lori at an event that she was helping to produce in the mid-1990s, and she did an awesome job. And I said to her at the end of the event, casually, I said, if somewhere down the road, some future time, you and your husband and your daughter ever would remotely consider the possibility of moving to New Mexico and working for me, I said, give me a call. It was Sunday afternoon, Monday morning, they called me. <laughs> Monday morning, she said, my husband wants to meet with you, and we've worked together ever since. So that's my office manager, Lori. Here's somebody who's very special to both you and I, and there's a story on this one there. always says, uh, let's have the next one, Carl. Ah, uh, this is Louise Hay. Louise Hay, the founder of Hay House Books. This is the last, my last time that I saw Louise alive. Uh, I didn't know it was going to be at the time. And what happened, I had just done the I Can Do It, Hay House I Can Do It's 
They had uh, just done the last I Can Do It in Fort Lauderdale, Florida. And I was invited to be the last speaker on the last day for the last ever Hay House I Can Do It. And I've been doing it since 2003. Uh, And I had just finished. I walked into the restaurant. Well, I had gone to the restaurant and finished. I was leaving. Louise was coming in. And somebody wanted a photo. And Louise looked at me and she said, you need some color in your life. Yeah, go back to the the, the photo because She said, you need some color. She took off the scarf that she was wearing and she dressed me in her scarf. And we took that picture. And that's the last time I saw Louise. Uh, Let's do one one more, Carl, because this is also... uh, This was... Now, I didn't know this, but this was at the same event. Because it was the last event, I was doing a tribute to Louise Hay and the authors that she had attracted and the company that she created. So I'm on stage here at a beautiful theater. I don't know if you have a picture of the theater in there or not. Uh, Yeah, go to the next one. The next one. This is the theater, the very last day. Beautiful theater, three tiers. Uh, It was completely sold out. And I had just done a tribute to Louise and then saw her at dinner after. So one funny story about Louise. The time before this, we had been backstage behind a big screen, and they are rear screen projections. So there's the projectors shooting behind the screen toward you rather than projecting from the front. Louise was backstage. She'd just gotten off stage. I was going on stage, and she came up, and she always gave me a big kiss. She came up and she gave me a big kiss right on on my lips. And it happened right in front of the projector that was projecting on the screen. And the silhouette, the silhouette showed for 3,000 people in the room saw me kiss Louise behind the stage on a huge silhouette. And that's, I've got, she was a a very brilliant, very powerful, very passionate woman. And she was a very brave woman. Very brave. In the 1980s, when the AIDS epidemic was first starting and no one knew what it was and she, everyone was afraid of it. She invited people into her home that had this new affliction that wasn't well understood. And she said very clearly, we don't know what this is, but whatever it is, there's something within us that can heal it. Let's find what that is. And that was how she began her journey. It became the book, You Can Heal Your Life. I once asked Louise, I said, uh, when you did uh, You Can Heal Your Life, what was the pushback? And she looked at me for a moment and she said, besides the death threats? And, yeah. I, and, and I said, you're kidding. And she said, that is how it was received yeah. by some. I remember that. Very brave woman. I was at Martin Marietta. We worked in a secure vault environment. You'd go in in the morning. There were no windows. They would close this vault. A little light would go on showing that you were in it to remind you you're in a secure environment. Mm-hmm. And uh, the cafeteria where we had lunch was in a secured environment. Yeah. And I remember when this happened, that the engineers, you started seeing people, they go through the cafeteria with their trays and said they didn't gather to talk. They would go into isolated little places and begin reading a couple of different books. One of them was um, A Course in Miracles had just come out. And the other one was You Can Heal Your Life by Louise Hay. And I remember people reading those books. That she had a very powerful influence. That over 40 million copies had been sold at the yeah. time of her death. And now that number is, is It's going to be more than that. Um, just quickly, this, uh, coming up to speed, there's a couple of people who made it very meaningful just in the last few years. Can we do this one? I want to see who they are. Oh, yeah. This is my dear friend, spiritual brother, colleague, uh, Howard Martin, who is one of the vice presidents of the Institute of Heart Math. Uh, He and I, we got together professionally in 1995. We became friends. Uh, After that, I can now call him one of my closest dear friends. We tour together. We travel together. uh, Present on stage as well as uh, Deborah Rosman from Heart Math. Next, uh, Carl. Right there. And this was at a Cryon yes. conference right. uh, where the three of us were presenting in Yellowstone is where this was. So this is uh, Deborah Rosman. She is also a vice president of a different part of HeartMath. Mm-hmm. Uh, I'm not their employee, but I met them about a year after they began doing what they're doing now. And they, as an independent author, they have given me permission to share their work in ways that they do not because they present primarily in corporations <laughs> A very corporate vibe, and we're not in a corporation. We're doing something in a very, very different level. So, this next picture, and go ahead, is a picture of you and Dr. Todd of Ukais. What is behind you? Where are this you? This is do- Dr. Todd and myself. We are in Geneva, Switzerland, at the CERN Superconducting Super Collider, and that is uh, a section of the Superconducting Super Collider right behind us. It's not in use. This was, they were showing some of the equipment mm-hmm. in, in a part, and this was in 16? I was there with you. That was, that was an was amazing it, was it, time. Was it 2016? For, yeah. 
Yeah. yeah. I like it because I'm such a nerd, but you, you loved it too. I saw that. And I want to tell you, well, I'm just going to tell you, and I, I think maybe Lee heard about this, uh, had this similar experience. We caught, I caught so much flack for yeah, going to CERN. And I was amazed. The Facebook community said, how could you go there and support what they had all kinds of fake news about what they thought was happening at CERN. And what I want to tell you is CERN itself doesn't do anything. All they do is they operate the equipment. They don't even do the experiments. They operate the equipment so universities can come in and do an experiment for a period of time and then they leave. Uh, so it's not like a CERN group of scientists that they operate this. It's the largest human built machine in existence. There's a lot. There's a, almost a university of young physicists there. Too. Yeah. And uh, it is the largest cooperative effort uh, for a uh, a, a corporate co uh, cooperative effort in the world right now. I think it's about 50 countries or something like that are cooperating yeah. to, to keep this thing, to explore the fundamental particles of matter and confirm what you and I probably already yeah. accept about the field of energy that connects all things and how we relate to that field. But that was, that, that was Dr. Todd and I there. Let's do another one. Who is this? You want to do the lightning round? Yeah. <laughs> this, okay, now this is interesting to me. Uh, because yesterday I, I was mistaken for Robert Coxon. And I, I certainly can see that resemblance now, I guess. No, I, I don't, no this is my... <laughs> so that's Robert Coxon from Canada, who is a musician that we've used forever. Yeah. Uh, with Cry, he's our, the cry on music. And of, of course, when they get together with Greg, uh, being both musicians, they kind of hit it off. We have done... I played flute with Robert in the yeah. past, and uh, Robert saved my life once. We were in France driving to Belgium. I was right behind you. You were driving to in Belgium on the freeway to yeah. do a gig, and there was an accident in front of us. And if Robert Coxon's reflexes yeah. The hood flew off the car in front of us, and airborne. He and he did a spin. He did a spin yeah. so that we didn't hit that hood with our windshield. That's right. Head on. And I, yeah. I owe my life to Robert Cox. He's a beautiful yeah. man, dear friend, and what an absolutely awesome, brilliant musician. Really? I'm, I was, I was right honored. behind you. If the happened. woman who mistook me for Robert is in here, thank you, because I was so honored. <laughs> I was surprised. But what an amazing musician to be. Thank you. What an amazing musician to be compared to. I was very honored. I, I glowed for the rest of yesterday All because right. of that. Thank you. Next slide, who is this? This is, if you're gonna come and see us in Vancouver, this is my dear sister friend and spiritual colleague, uh, Lynn McTaggart. Wrote the book, The Field, wrote the book, The Intention Experiment, wrote the book, uh, The Power of Eight. Uh, this is, we were at a conference in London. I went to her part of the world and we are on a panel discussion together. And we're listening to someone and we both have very different reactions about what we're listening yes. to. <laughs> okay. Candid pictures. Let's yep. do another one. This, I, uh, this is a very powerful image for me. This was in Sedona, Arizona, uh, where I do a conference every spring. This was the last time I was with the eldest elder of the Hopi Nation, Grandfather Martin, before he passed. Uh, this is the, the, the last, actually the only picture I have uh, with Grandfather Martin here. And he, he could no longer hear when this, prayer, this picture was taken, but he would still sing his songs, his prayers. Uh, of peace and healing, and he's just a beautiful, beautiful man. Uh, now, yeah. Uh, I know your connection to the indigenous, and I feel this. We've got, I've got two pictures here before we do something um, amusing, uh -oh. and uh, they are powerful for me uh, in, in ways uh, because I know the story and for you too, mm. and it's happened very recently. Yeah. Uh, let's have the next one, uh, Carl. Okay, this is my mom now. This was taken uh, the week between Thanksgiving and Christmas of 17, just a few weeks ago. My mom no longer knows me. She uh, is advanced um, dementia, Alzheimer's. Uh, I cannot care for her in my home any longer. I had to find, a, it's a really beautiful care facility. It's a memory care facility. Uh, it's a Spanish hacienda. They have goats, chickens, uh, a small community of only 25 people. I was her date on this night at mm -hmm. a holiday party. Mm -hmm. And during the course of the evening, when I first, she doesn't know me, and it's really, it, it, it's, I don't know many of you know what that's like. During the course of the evening, there was a two hour party and something clicked. And there was this moment of lucidity where she remembered who I was, and this is it, she's looking yeah. at me. Right. And she said to the woman who took this picture, this is my son. This is my son. And in that, in that moment, and it was such a really beautiful, powerful Can we moment. see the next one too? Because this is her then looking yeah, at Yeah, this the is camera. after two hours. She, she can't, uh, her legs are so weak, she doesn't walk. So we sat in that chair. We actually danced sitting down uh, in that chair for two hours. And she's, you know, you can tell she's a little fatigued here. 
And, um, but it was a really, really great night. We've got great, if I never saw my mom again, I have such beautiful memories of this night. Uh, it was, I was and, and I was supposed to be in Israel for a reconnaissance trip that did not happen. Uh, and I went back home and had this time with my mom. If I'd gone to Israel when I was supposed to, I wouldn't have had this time with my mom. So thank got, you, Lee. For, got, thanks for sharing you're this. You're welcome. Yeah. I've got uh, two subjects left and some more pictures. Um, in the advertisements, uh, right now is when we're supposed to finish, and we're not going to. Um, so this is for the listeners and for you. We're going to continue until we're done. Is that all right, audience? Is that, um, yeah. we, can, we can continue? All right, good. Um, I you, don't know what we're doing, so I'm just going to say wanna, yes. I want to talk, just because nobody thinks about these things. You, t you told me once you had stalkers. <laughs> What's it like? I mean, what does that mean? Well, I've been doing this. Uh, this is my 33rd year. And in those 33, 33 years, I've only had two dangerous stalkers. So I think that's a pretty good average <laughs> of people that, that felt it was their karmic duty to take me off the planet. Mm -hmm. I've, I've had have two of those. One of them apologized after she went back on her medication. <laughs> okay. Um, but there are, this is part of, and you all know this. I mean, okay, this, the new age movement means a lot of things to a lot of people. And we've had people who are convinced that uh, we need to complete, I need to complete something with them in this lifetime that started in another lifetime. And, mm -hmm. Uh, have have actually moved their families and followed me to places where I've lived, uh, hoping that, that that would happen. Um, I've been pretty lucky uh, in terms of, of stalkers. I mean, they haven't shown up in my hotel room. That's good. Yeah, that's happened to other people. <laughs> yeah. Uh, you know, or anything like that. But there are people that are very passionate and impassioned about what they believe. And, and you know, for me, uh, my work has always been less about me and more about the work. I, I like to de-emphasize myself. Um, if I could take myself out of the equation and just share the work, I would. So I'm always a little amazed when, when so much of that significance is, is given to me. It's not in, about that, in that same way, there's something I want to talk about. You can go as far as you want to with this one, and, and I know who you are and probably what you're going to do. But all of us, um, having done these things for this many years, will have disappointments that people want to take what we have done, yeah. uh, put their name on it, and call it theirs. Sure. Uh, I've actually had that with my work. Uh, I've had many, I've had people sell conferences uh, with my picture and sure. things of like that, and I wasn't involved. And I know this has happened to you, and I know that there's been some profound uh, things that it's very, very clearly. Uh, yeah. do you, to any degree that you wish to address this, um, tell us what you think. Yeah, well, the first time it happened, I was surprised, and it's actually, it's happened over the years where people, the first time it happened were people that were my friends, that I trusted, a triple cancerian. So it's all about nurturing and, and you know, friendship. And, and so people would invite me, they'd say, come and do a seven day workshop and bring everything you've got and make handouts, by the way, uh -huh. of all your material. And I'd say, okay, <laughs> <laughs> let's do a big workshop. And I would leave and I would learn a few weeks later that all my handouts became a book that they were now publishing and all my work they were trying to teach. Or I've had people that travel with me, you know, we, I take groups into Peru, uh, Egypt, Tibet, Bolivia, not so much all those places anymore, primarily Peru. Uh, but they would go on the trip and they'd say, oh, uh, all I have to do is use the same itinerary Greg's using and I can do my own trips. They have no idea what has to happen behind the scenes. The security that we create, checking in with the authorities, sometimes every hour to make sure what we're doing is safe. Working with the people preparing our food. We might have 20 people preparing a meal, but only two people ever physically touch our food and their hands are sterilized before they do that. And if you don't know that, and, and we run because the way we do it, it's transparent. People don't know. It looks easy because we do a really good job. We've learned to do a good job over the years. So I've had people mimic that and they've tried to do those trips and they've had horrible experiences. They've become so sick. Some of them were hospitalized. The people that wrote books based on my work, they were interviewed. The interviewer asked them questions about their work and they couldn't answer it because it's not their work. So one of two things has to happen when that occurs. You either lie and say something is not true or you're honest and say, I don't know. And if your ego is going to make a book that you stole from someone anyway, your ego is probably not going to feel comfortable saying, I don't know the answer. Mm -hmm. So what happens is false information gets disseminated. 
When I think about it, uh, and I've asked if, if it makes me angry. I've never been angry about it. I have to, and all, I'll just tell you all right now. Um, I'm a Cancerian male. And Cancerian males, we tend to be hurt before we're angry. Disappointed and hurt. And I am disappointed in my friends, right. and it hurts, hurts me yeah. that it happens. Mm -hmm. And also, I really advocate for my audience. I always try, if you've ever been with me in a venue, I want a beautiful, uplifting venue. I want good quality sound, good quality images to honor you that have come to see me from halfway around the world sometime. So knowing that my work is out there in ways that I don't have any control over and sometimes is misrepresented and then people email me and they say, well, you know, you said this in this book. And I said, actually, I didn't say that. You know, that's, that's somebody else's work. Wasn't your so book. this has happened. There's a, there was a man in Australia that was actually, he took my VHS video, put his own title on it, and was selling it, and people said, isn't that Greg Braden? And he'd say, well, yeah, but, you know. <laughs> yeah. And, so? And, and I, there's a guy, there was a guy in Italy that did the same thing with my workshops, and people called me, and they said, do you know that he's teaching your work? And I said, I, I, I do now, because you just told me. And I said, how's he doing? And they said, oh, I said, not, I can't tell you what they said, because we're on the camera. But they said, it's not going well at all. So, you know, the universe has a way of yeah. balancing these yeah. things out. Uh, my, my regret is that the work, my work can be misrepresented and people hear it differently. Yeah. Uh, for example, I've, I've had people recently in interviews say, this Greg Braden, he was one of the doomsday sayers about the end of the world, you know, in 2012. And I said, did you read any of my work? And they, they didn't. But other people said that I was. That's not what I said at this all. This is exactly what has happened to me yeah. on YouTube. I know it is, yeah. And there will be things that say, uh, Cryon says the end of the world is coming. And they will get their advertisement, they'll get their clicks, and they will go to a channel of mine. It's nothing to do with it. Uh, it is quite uplifting. So yeah. this is very common. Yeah. It, it happens. Yeah. And, um, and also, I mentioned, I've got over 30 pages of YouTube videos. <laughs> Where the technology is right now, Bruce Lipton and I both talked about this. We were just in Milan, Italy. Before we got off the stage in Milan, what we had just presented was on YouTube. Yeah. It had been recorded and uploaded from the yeah. audience, and it was on YouTube before we ever even left the stage. We, we were in, we were in just, just we, we were in Turkey, and we told the audience no videos. And there was a guy about three quarters of the way black, back who had a video camera with a light. <laughs> oh, yeah. and, and it was huge, and it stayed on. And we, we had to say, excuse me, are you like doing a video? Yeah, people don't know that from they, where we are, we can see that we light. We can see everything, but yeah. this was a huge light. It wasn't just a red light. I mean, this was a bright light. Yeah. So it's just astonishing what, they, what they'll do. I want to do something fun. This is cute and this is cute, funny. I happen to know a story. Just, it's a, a fun one. You, we go through security all the time. We go through, you know, and yeah. you were going through customs. And you were taken aside. In fact, they saw you and they said, Mr. Gray, uh, Mr. Braden, we want you uh, to come with us for a moment. Yep. Uh, and what went through your head? What happened? Well, this has happened twice. Uh, the first time when I was taken aside in security, I was in a foreign country. So the last thing you want to do is have security, the guys that say policia, to have them come up and say, come into this, this room, this, behind this door that has no window you know, on it, and, and sit here for a while. So I, what was going through my mind, I thought, you know, um, I didn't know what was happening. Oh. I can't tell you what I was really thinking yeah. because we're on camera, but <laughs> I almost did. Uh, so I, I went in this room and I waited and waited and waited and pretty soon the door opened and about six security people came in and I thought, ooh, this must be really bad if it takes six of them. And they all had uh, a, <laughs> a magazine had published an article and my picture was on the cover and they wanted me to sign their magazine. <laughs> That I that love. Was, that is a, that I love. Something similar happened at the Albuquerque International Airport. Uh, there's something called Global Entry, TSA Global Entry, where you have to go through a security interview. And I went through an entire security interview. I thought we were done. And he said, can I ask you just to sit here and wait for a few minutes? And I said, are we finished? He says, almost. And I waited and waited and waited. And pretty soon I saw some other guys coming through the door. And they all went yeah, to the back. The and then thing. the guy came. And <laughs> there was a, a little magazine. It's free in the airport. I think it's called Truly Alive. 
uh, and I was uh, I did and I had been out of the country, so I didn't know I was on that magazine. And I was on the cover, and they they wanted the same thing. So it was, it was all good news. When you go through airports, I know that people. You've told me people <laughs> mistake you for stars. Depends on what country. That's I'm right. In. And one of them. Would you show this? Um, is uh, <laughs> Andy Gibb. This is Andy Gibb, right? And this is how he looks right now. Now I can understand that a little bit. Um, I don't know if you can. Okay, but I was uh, now Andy. Andy Gibb lives in South Florida. I was at the Palm Beach International Airport, uh, and I, I got out, uh, and I had a, a driver in a big black car that had taken me there. Right. So I got out, and the the um, the attendant curbside curbside check. He said, uh, he goes, "Are you Andy Gibb?" And I said, "No." And he said. <laughs> he said, your, your secret's safe with me. So I, I got to the ticket counter, and they, at the ticket counter, they said, Mr. Gibb, you don't have to wait in this line. Come, come over the other side. <laughs> and by the time I got to security, they, oh. everybody was saying Andy Gibb was coming through security. So yeah, there you and, were. Uh, I don't look like that now. There was a time my hair was longer. Mm -hmm. You might have. You know, yeah. my, hair, my hair began turning silver the month... Of, I buried my father. That's mm. when it happened, 2004. Mm. And it was right around that time. My hair was about that long, and I can, I can see maybe... Well, here's another star that people um, mistake you for. That's Wolverine. Would you show that? I can understand this. Uh, now this, I, this one I understand. Oh, I'm honored. I'm honored. Uh, this looks a lot like you. Um, let, let's go ahead and show a Wolverine now. There, is, there he is today. Uh, you know, maybe sometimes. I don't know. I don't know. But do you have Chuck Norris in there? You do. Next slide. Okay. Now this, this, I don't look like this isn't the one, but there's, no, there's, there's no a one. movie that Chuck Norris made and he and I had hair very similar. When I get off the plane in Lima, Peru, for some reason, they think I'm Chuck Norris. So I had these kids that came up and they said, Chuck Norris, Chuck Norris. And I said, no, I said, Greg. And they said, just sign Chuck Norris. So I said, okay, okay. So I signed Chuck Norris and we, we did it. So I don't know. You know, I just have, gotta, gotta go with it sometimes. They said, you're somebody. I was at LAX where the paparazzi waits for people. Yes. And there was a guy, a Camry guy there at the bottom of the escalator for American Airlines. And he saw me one day going in and he said, are you somebody? I forgot even who. And I said, no. He goes, well, you're somebody. And so he started taking pictures. I don't know who you are, but you're somebody, you know, and he yeah, was going to yeah. do something with him. I don't know, probably National Enquirer. I don't know. That, that must be it. Greg Braden has the Dead Sea Scrolls in his appendix or something. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> All right. We're on the final Thing. The final I, stretch, want to, I want to give you um, the lightning round. <laughs> the lightning round. It's a it's a quote from you, and then I want to take you through some uh, some photos of some countries, and just very sure. briefly, just make some comments. And here's the quote I want to read. Uh, when I asked Greg uh, in the the question, some of the questions I was going to ask him, what is profound and rewarding, really? What's profound and rewarding to you? And here's what he said: He says the opportunity to document firsthand some of the most beautiful, remote, pristine, and rugged places remaining on the earth today. Places that have marked the turning points in our past and have defined our world history. And so I'm just, we're just lightning round through uh, some pictures in Peru, Tibet, Egypt, uh, Yucatan, and, and then yeah. we'll see. And, and the people, the people and, that and the, preserved that The people that, that were there. Yeah, yeah. So let's, let's go to the next one, uh, and it's, um, it's going to be Peru. Uh, this, uh, this is a shaman that I have worked with now for about 15 years. He's a Caro shaman. You studied with Mich Michelle. Are you in the room? Uh, if you studied with Michelle, you know about the Quetero. Uh They live uh, about 15,000 feet above sea level. There aren't many of them left uh, in about three villages in the southern Andes. And this, this be and by the way, he's standing on his tiptoes here. Yeah. He's about the height of, of my mom. He leaves his village for three to four days when I take my group into Peru so he can be with us. And while he's gone, his village, the village has no elder. They have no shaman. They have no uh, the, the wisdom that comes from him. Uh, but he comes and he's worked with us many, many years. Uh, his name is Don Benito, and he loves to hug. He loves uh, to give us hugs. He gives everybody hugs. Let's do the next one. Yep. This beautiful woman, this is Marlene. Marlene was on the cover of National Geographic over 20 years ago, and she looks exactly like she looks. This was taken last year. She has not changed. Marlene is a Quechua woman. She has organized the women in the village of Chinchero, in the southern Andes into a co-op uh, so that they can support the schools and they can support the families. And ladies, you would love this because the women run the shop and the men work for the women. So it's a, it's a really good way, good way to do this. And she's become a dear, dear sister, dear sister to me. Next. 
This is, uh, when we go to Peru, uh, to me, Peru is not Peru until we go near the Bolivian border in Lake, Lake Titicaca. And this uh, is on one of the artificial floating reed islands that the natives have built for over a thousand years. Uh, everything is the same color as the straw except the textiles. And I've got my group here, and we are shopping with the textiles, the really beautiful colored textiles here. I'm, I'm, I'm a good shopper. I'm a power shopper. I'm having power a great shopping. time here. <laughs> Let's do the next one. I like this one. So it's a um, really candid of you. Is this one actually a favorite one? You know what? I, I love this for this reason. I, I'm okay here in Colorado. I'm really at my best at really high elevations, and I love Peru. If I didn't live in New Mexico, I would live in Peru. And uh, somebody caught me. This is one of the people on our trip caught me uh, just beaming. Uh, I was just a happy Greg, happy boy on this day. Happy Greg. Uh, this is an Ollante Tambo, the temple complex of Ollante Tambo on the first day where the group is out. All right, next. Oh, I love this picture. All right, I work with the same guides and translators now that I began with in 1986. Uh, my tour operator had a daughter before his wife passed away and his daughter is, looks exactly like his wife. And I met her when she was nine years old. And this is her 20 years later, last year, when she now is a guide. And we get to work with her. Uh, and somebody got a picture of us. She just had her first baby. She's married. She's had her first baby. And um, this is us together. Uh, I've known her since she was nine years old. Next Peru picture. Last Peru picture. Yeah, this is, uh, this is part of my Peruvian family. Now, this was taken at a high pass, a little over 14,000 feet above sea level. It's a, a, baby, it's a, a baby lamb and a, a llama that are there. It's not a baby, a baby llama. Uh, but again, I love being in high elevation, and this captured that, that very moment. That's right. what's happening there. Turn the page. Next one, Tibet. Ah, uh -huh. my very first trip into Tibet. This is the Podola Palace outside of Lhasa. Uh, about 12,000 feet above sea level. It is a massive, massive... Uh, well, this is the home of the Dalai Lama yeah. uh, before he was exiled in 1959. Mm -hmm. Next. This uh, is a monastery about 16,500 feet above sea level. It took us 16 days approximately to get there, to acclimate. Uh, it's one of the most remote monasteries, and the more remote they are, the more intact they are. And what we went through to get here, I think we're going to talk about. Yeah. In fact, the next ones um, I have seen in your uh, presentations, and it's, it's, it's absolutely profound. Uh, let's do this next one. It's the unlocking of a door. So we had gone uh, to this monastery. And what I know is that every, every monastery, every Buddhist monastery, there's a library that's hidden. It's supposed to be a secret library, but they're, they're all there. So I had just asked, and look how young this monk is in this picture. Most of the monks you will see are they're very young or they're very old. The ones middle age, our age, were all exiled or killed in the revolution. So this is a young monk. And I asked him, will you show me this group, your hidden library? And they don't get much company here. And he is thrilled to be able to open this door to an empty chanting hall and show us the library. Next. We get to see that library. Here's here the library. Yeah. This, is, uh, this was a library. Um, that's my hand at the bottom of the, of the image. With a, I've got a flashlight. We're looking up. Yeah. It's three stories tall, but it's only about 12 feet wide. And we're looking at the corner where two walls meet. These are, are Tibetan books are 1,500 years old. Uh, and this library now no longer exists. It's been dismantled. Mm. So I'm happy that we have the photographic records of this uh, Next, there's one more. Of, uh, yeah, and this is, these are Tibetan or... books. They're loose pages sandwiched between the, the covers here is what these are. Amazing. Next. Yeah. I say they were dismantled uh, and the, the books were taken. They were given to universities, to libraries, yeah. some private collections. Yeah. Yeah. This, this is the abbot of a monastery that I had never met. There was a previous abbot that I'd known for years. I went back and he was gone. And I said, where is he? And they just said, he's gone. And I said, did he die? Did he get transferred? They, all they could tell me is he wasn't there. This is the new younger abbot who's only in his 80s. And uh, somebody captured us going through a ceremony where I'm meeting him at the first time. And this is called a kata. I'm exchanging a kata where I offer it to him. Yes. He either keeps it or blesses it and gives it back. In this case, he, he gave it back to me. Next. <coughs> the, same, uh, the same trip, uh, we had the opportunity to meet nuns uh, in a nearby nunnery. And not many people go to where, where the nuns are. And this was... Uh, uh, there's so much I could say about these beautiful ladies. They're very strong. 
very powerful, very resilient, very compassionate women. And I enjoy being with them. And because I was very close to this uh, very recently, what's that around your neck? Around her neck. I can't around see what you're saying. Oh, around my neck? Yeah. I'm wearing, uh, is it a kata? Yes. Yeah, I'm wearing one of the, probably the kata that the, the that abbot that he just gave given back to, to me. you. Yeah. That's correct. They're, they're yeah. white, uh, and they're, they're, it's, it's a currency that's yes. an exchange. That's right. Yeah. That's a, it's actually pretty formal when you meet them. And then they, yeah, it is formal. That's right. Yeah. Next. Okay, I didn't know we were going to go back this far. <laughs> this was my first trip into Tibet. I used to carry a native flute everywhere I go, everywhere in the world, I would take a native flute. So we went into this monastery, and I didn't know, I, this was at the end of the trip. And all through the trip, I kept saying, who am I going to give this flute to? I'm going to leave it here in Tibet. I'm not taking it home with me. And no, I mean, there were people I could have given it to, and it would have collected dust. I'd never touch it again. So we got to this monastery, and I'm playing the flute, and you can, can you see this monk? Can you see the look on his face? Yeah. He is into this flute. And when I finished playing, I offered it to him as a gift. And do we have a picture of him? Uh, I think so. Next. Accepting. There we are. I'm offering it as a gift, and he is absolutely thrilled. But here, this is a hoot. When you think of Tibet, the word hygiene is not the first thing that comes to mind, usually. <laughs> the first thing he did when I gave him this flute was he took and he wiped this mouthpiece off on this uh. dirty old room. <laughs> and then the next, the next, next image, I may have changed forever the culture in Tibet. He's, yes. And he learned to do this really quickly. So here he is playing a Native American red cedar flute from the Taos Pueblo. It's a five-hold flute, and it now lives in, uh, in Tibet. Something in Tibet that also happened to you that, uh, that you, I've heard you talk about. The next slide. This is where it never snows. Is that right? <laughs> my very first trip, <clears throat> my guide, uh, was a brilliant man. Uh, he and his partner were the fifth and sixth Americans given visas to teach English when they opened China uh, for the first time to, to trade mm -hmm. in commerce. And he told me, I said, what's well, a good time to go? And he told me, and he said, you know, it only, it only snows early in the year, so you're, you're probably, you know, safe. So I think we went like in June. So we were at the high pass one night, and it started to snow. And it snowed like crazy. It snowed and snowed and snowed. It snowed so much that there was an avalanche blocking the only road so that we could get to the monastery that you've already seen the picture of. Okay, let's go to the next one. That is the avalanche, and you can see there's a little tunnel cut through, and I asked, I asked my guide, I said, well, how long until this is cleaned off? And he said, well, eh, you know, three or four months. And I said, why so long? And he says, it's going to take that long for the snow to, to melt. And I said, well, don't they, like, don't they, like, help? And he says, eh, we can, but, you know, why? So we had a bus on Next. one side of this. I can't show it well. I, yeah, the, the next slide. Okay. That go. bus was on one side of that avalanche. It would not fit through the opening, and we had to, to take all of our belongings, leave. we never saw the bus again, and walk through the avalanche. Okay, next. You can see how tall yeah. that snow is to the only mode of transportation we could find on the other side. And I tell you, I was thrilled to find. Yeah, go to the next one. Yeah, until, until we could find that, that open bed truck that you can see the avalanche behind us. Yeah. Uh, that took us to that, and, because that's the only way to get to these monasteries. They were used to get to, everybody would be there. I have one slide of New Mexico. Only oh. one. Ah. Okay, this is a, re a recent slide. I take groups into uh, the Four Corners area, including Chaco Canyon. Uh, where there are a number of kivas, underground ceremonial structures that have been excavated. Uh, few people know north of Chaco Canyon, near Aztec and Farmington, uh, is the only restored kiva that I'm aware of. And what you're looking at, this is an underground, fully restored Native American kiva. This is what they look like. Uh, and you can see, I mean, they are very, very, very nice, very powerful, very sacred. You're, you're in the womb of the earth mm -hmm. when you're inside of one of these. So that's, I just got a couple more pictures and they are of, um, of Egypt and we're going to say goodbye. So let's, let's okay. do this one. I mentioned earlier Mount Sinai. Uh, this is St. Catherine's monastery looking down in the valley uh, on the mountain of Mount Sinai. This is where I hiked back down to after I had my experience that I shared a little bit earlier. Mm -hmm. One more of Egypt. Well, this is Egypt and other, other places. In the lower right-hand corner, this is the first trip to Egypt, uh, to uh, a site that was being excavated in the village of Saqqara. Uh, it is a temple complex of the beings that are called Hathors. And what you're looking at, I'm, uh, that is the top of a column 
from the temple, and the floor is still 30 feet under the surface of the earth where I'm standing. They haven't excavated down yet. Uh, and a dear friend of mine, Tom Kenyon, had just written a book about the Hathors, and he asked if he could use my slide because he'd never been to Egypt. So I gave him my slide of the Hathors, and when I went back the next time, I took, I guess the second time, I took his book and held it next to the actual image where his... I, I presented with Tom Kenny. We just came from Egypt where we were at a temple with the Hathors. A lot of disfigured images of, oh, yeah. Yeah. Well, of that's the, why, the this goddess is so, of love. And this one is beautiful. That's why this is so powerful. Yeah. This was the one site that was buried and was not disfigured. Not disfigured. And they excavated yeah. and, and yeah. exposed the, the faces. There. Okay. Two more photos and we're going to say more? goodbye. <laughs> okay. Just two more. Yeah, and more, they're okay. uh, Yucatan. This is a Yucatan uh, in Mexico, and these are remnants of ancient... The one in the upper left is Olmec. These are the Olmec heads, and we're not sure. We don't know who these people were, where they came from. Mm -hmm. uh, the lower right is Mayan. Obviously, these are Mayan hieroglyphs. Um, I have taken groups down. There's a whole history, and another time we can talk about what's happening. Okay. But that, that's and the last photo. Up. This is our shaman that we work with in the Yucatan, uh, and this is in the archaeological site of Palenque, if you've ever been in the Palenque. Uh, and I am amazed that their hair stays black forever. I want to know, I want to know their secret. <laughs> and another, another program, I'll talk to you about their secret. Yeah, uh, you have a secret. Um, I have it written here, so you, you told me that from 1986 to the current, you had a waist that was what? <laughs> what did it measure? So when I was in high school, um, my waist was 29 and my, my jeans were 30. And now it is? It, it's 30, 30. One inch. Make, makes it much easier. I hate you. Well, when I, <laughs> what, when, one I, inch. when I do the 60s one parties, inch. I can pull out my bell bottoms and they still fit. <laughs> they so still, it, they it, still it's fit. A good, it's a good we have closets where we can identify how old we were by the size of our clothes. Well, so this is very different. It, take, it takes a lot of work. Uh, it's a project rebuilding from the inside out. Uh -huh. and, um, That's great. Yeah, well, you know, it's for me to do what I'm doing. I yeah. could not do this if I didn't take care of myself. Greg Brady. Thank you. Thank you. This is so Thank you, awesome. Brother. It's so awesome. Thank you. One last thing. Thank you all for hanging in I, there. I want to, uh, is there anything we didn't say that you'd like to say? You know, I think we pretty much, co I, we covered it. I uh, thank you for sharing some memories from my life. I've never done this before. Yeah. Uh, and those are some of the very few photographs that remain. So yes, thank you for giving do. me the opportunity to All right. share those. I don't talk about myself a lot, probably more than you wanted to hear tonight. And um, well, this is what we wanted to hear tonight. This right. is the reason for this show. And I know that we've gone over, but we've gone over it for a good reason. Greg, thank you so much. We're going to say goodbye. I want to thank you Let's all say. for being here.